Good evening. Good night. It's been a good session. <laughs> Welcome to the Device Tree Track. I'm Frank Rowland. I'm one of the Device Tree maintainers. Rob is hiding right in front, right front. another maintainer. Uh, Rob is also a binding maintainer. At um, ELC Europe, I got to dodge a lot of questions because I could just say, oh, that's a bindings question. Talk to the bindings maintainer. He's here today. <laughs> Grant Likely, device tree maintainer at Meredith is here. Uh, lots of other maintainers who can answer questions are here. Uh, we're really, um, well, first of all, we're taking notes on Etherpad. So anyone in the audience can take notes and contribute. It's a, it's a point and click. What you s type is what you see. I'd encourage you to actually start taking notes on Etherpad. And if we can find a volunteer to especially pay attention to that, would would like to seek one of those out. Uh, Sean is the co-coordinator of this track. He's okay. put a lot of work into making this go hopefully smoothly today. Um, notes after the fact will be hopefully on the plumber's website, but I don't know. Uh, the coordinator says yes. They'll also be on the elinux.org wiki, which the embedded Linux group, the CELP project of the Linux Foundation maintains. And I'll, I'll put these URLs up several times later in the, the event. Here's the schedule. It's going to be a little bit flexible. The timing is really tight. We tried to cram too much in. So what we're going to do is if any session ends a little bit early, we're not just going to hang out and go take a break. We'll just jump into the next session and try and get, try and recover as much time as we can as we're going. Um, and I'm not going to go through the agenda in detail. You've all seen the schedule. So just jump right into our very first session. Before we do that. Um, yeah. So a couple of administrative oh, things. Sorry. Yeah, um, of course, if, if you've been here, you've seen these. We need to make sure that we use mics for questions and discussion or else the recording isn't going to have it. Uh, I'm going to be uh, trying to take notes, but I need a volunteer because I'm a little constrained. Moritz, um, thank you very much um, as far as running mics. And also, if I can get somebody who's going to be actively um, adding notes to Etherpad, that would be very much appreciated. I'll take care of that. Really. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few, we, we didn't talk about this, but yeah, we, we, we have a few speaker items that uh, I think we said we were going to do one for best question. Is that right? Sure. We can cut up as we go. Sure. We can change the rules. We, we can change the rules because that's part of being the organizer. Say that again? <laughs> anyway. All right, so I just wanted to do that. So if I start giving you a signal if you're up here or if I start doing this to people with questions, then we want to move on because we do want to try and make sure that the recording is, is uh, keeping up with the schedule. And where to keep speakers. Oh, uh, yeah, one other logistical thing uh, for the recording speakers, we need to kind of try and stay on this side. Apparently, it's up, if you go over that way, you're not going to be in the recording. Cool. Thank you. So here we are, questions and answers. Um, again, if, if we don't use the whole session, we'll just recover this time and we can do more questions and answers later. Uh, this was just trying to sweep up some questions early in the event. And I'm guessing that there are going to be questions that evolve as we start having sessions. And when a session ends and we haven't answered all the questions, we can push those questions. There's another question and answer session later. Um, Questions? Anybody have any burning questions they've brought to the conference this week? Can we make this a really short session? <laughs> we have much longer question and answers later if that happens. Nobody. Wow, you guys have just made the schedule so much better. We'll move on to the next session, which is Rob. And he gave me his slides, and I haven't uploaded them yet. So while Frank's doing that, again, the more you guys uh, add into this process, the, the more you're going to take away from it. So if you have any questions that occur to you later on, uh, we are going to have another Q&A session, uh, which apparently just got quite a bit longer because this one <laughs> we had left time to, to cover topics. So if there's something that is of interest to you, 
Um, the, the focus on these isn't for us to give you presentations, it's for discussion. So please, I know it's first thing in the morning and a lot of us are tired, but uh, let's, let's try and throw input in, please. Yeah, are people awake yet? No. Is that the? <laughs> Should we start with calisthenics? Yeah. That's probably a good idea. Is it possible to do a recap of where she gave it everything that she gave us? Because not everyone may know all the blood. Sorry. Well, thank you. Is it possible to do a quick recap of the state of everything? Because make sure everyone's on the same level set. Given that there's no questions coming up, yeah, I figure. We <laughs> yeah. Life, the universe, and everything. Here, you want this one? Some of this is where you're going to cover in the talk already. Yeah, so there's the schema that I'm going to talk about next. And uh, originally, we had uh, device tree.org update uh, that I was going to talk about, and we took that out. So, briefly on that. Uh, there's a small trickle of patches that go in. Uh, there's some, been some prep work for uh, a connector binding, um, basically a GPIO map uh, binding, which allows you to remap GPIO no numberings from connector numbering to. Yeah, sure. Um, so GPIO map lets you remap uh, connector GPIO numbering to the baseboard uh, or one level back numbering of GPIOs. Um, probably going to do another spec release at the end of this year just to have a yearly cadence of releases. But that's kind of uh, what's happening on the spec uh, front. What else you want to update on? Uh, reviewing bindings. Uh, converting bindings to schema. I'll probably remember control shift P at the very end of the day. Can I get the slides up there? Can I do it from the podium? Okay. That's fine. All right, today I'm talking about uh, JSON schema for uh, device tree bindings. Um, this this is what I work on uh, when I'm not reviewing your bindings that you're uh, submitting. Um, so who here has never been to a session on schema for device tree? Only a few. Good. So this is kind of a perennial topic. Um, So what's the problem? Uh, 
it's too easy to get device tree wrong. Um, the data must be encoded in specific ways, like you have p handles plus cells where you, and that depends on another property. Um, it's kind of strange uh, property of device trees. The tool chain provides little validation. Um, that's kind of been changing over time. Uh, there's a lot more checks within uh, DTC now, but it's limited to uh, common bindings that don't require binding, binding specific information or, or specific information for a, a given device. Um, there are uh, no checks against the documented schema, so it's freeform text. Uh, what you write to, in the binding document may or may not match what ends up in the DTS, and um, it's not always <coughs> clear uh, what the constraints are from the binding document relative to checking a DTS file. And it's too much manual review. Um, since it's freeform text, it always varies in their small ways, and uh, you have a lot more of this could be automated if we had something machine parsable. And it's a steep learning curve, uh, learning device tree. Um, I had a dime for every time I said bindings describe the hardware, I could maybe retire. Uh, though on the last one, I'm not sure that uh, JSON schema is going to solve that problem because that's yet another learning curve. So I did a little archaeology, uh, and I think some of the past uh, schema presentations have also done archaeology of all the past schema attempts. Uh, so starting back in 2013, um, uh, I think was probably one of the first uh, attempts, and it was doing C-based checks in DTC. Um, that never went upstream, but a lot of what it was doing that uh, has gone upstream in, in form of checks, and if, if you've noticed, uh, you can now get thousands of warnings uh, if you build with warnings turned on uh, for your DTS files. Um, but that also handled binding specific uh, checks, which DTC is, uh, does not support and um, probably never really will in C because we need something that's easily expandable to, uh, there's about 3,000 binding documents currently. Uh, then there were a couple of attempts uh, to use DTS itself as a schema uh, language from uh, Benoit and Fabian, and then I think Tomas took that and evolved that. <coughs> and then there was a bit of a break uh, in efforts, and uh, we had the first attempt at using YAML as a schema language. Um, that was kind of a custom syntax, uh, and it didn't really address how, how we deal with constra constraints. Um, and Matt Porter did that uh, three years ago now. Uh, then a year later, uh, Grant took that and, and evolved that into something that I think did add some constraints checking. It was still custom language. Um, and last year, there were kind of two parallel attempts uh, further evolving uh, what Matt originally did. One was uh, using eBPF for the constraint uh, language. Uh, don't ask me to explain that one. Uh, and then uh, Grant had started looking at JSON schema um, as, as an option. And at that point, it was, uh, I was not there, but more of an idea and not really to a working state. Um, and as far as I know, Grant uh, came up with that 
pretty much on his own, but then in my research, I found a mention of using JSON, which is not JSON schema exactly, but does mention that there's parsers and validators and schema for JSON. And that was back in 2013, uh, I think probably around the time of the second one, I think was the thread. And that's thanks to Allison. So what are the, the goals here? And it, um, before I go any further, if anyone has questions, if I just go through the slides, uh, we'll be even farther ahead of schedule, so please ask questions um, relative to the slides. Anybody, does anybody have a question about why this is necessary? You just discussed it in the first slide, but I'm going to keep poking at people until they start asking questions. Does, does everyone agree it's necessary? Silence means agreement. Does, does this mean you want new bindings to be in this format rather than converting? Uh, we want everything. So you want everything converted? Yeah. But I've got patches on the list at the moment which are just free standard free form text. Should yeah, I if you're on V10, I'm sorry, you're going to have to convert it now. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want to, I'm going to get into that, but I want to uh, get the infrastructure in place, start converting stuff, not require new stuff quite yet. It has to be JSON schema, and then s start requiring it at some point. Uh, no. I'll be uh, less grumpy if I get JSON schema bindings. <laughs> I hope. The, if, if, if you are writing stuff and you go ahead and use the JSON schema format, I mean, it's, it just makes things nicer because even if you get it wrong, it's easier to parse what it, what's in there and use some scripts to fix it up than if it's just the plain text prose that it is right now. So if you're writing stuff now, do your best to try to ma match this, and then we'll fix it when it's wrong. Yeah. Well, someone else will fix it, because I tend not to do anything anymore. I mean, you're touching on a practicality, right? Which is that while this is in transition, it's going to be a little bit messy. But yeah. the closer you get to what we're, we're trying to get to, the less work you're going to have later. And I've tried to work through some corner cases, but I'm sure I have not worked through all of them. And, and in some cases, we made to start with, well, for this, this binding property, our constraint is the freeform text that we had already, because we haven't figured out how to improve that. But as long as the overall document structure is following it, that's a, an improvement on its own. So. I had a comment uh, about the, something you said earlier about uh, device trees are hard, essentially, um, and, and you keep having to mention that, you know, it describes the hardware and so on and so forth. Um, I'm wondering if a schema actually solves that particular issue, and I apologize, I'm, I'm sure I'm poking the bear here, but the um, fact of the matter is a lot of Linux people trying to dick around with the device trees don't actually understand hardware or can't get the documentation. Right. And that's what's hard is understanding how it works and putting it together, I think, as opposed to, you know, uh, trying to actually put it in, you know, if you will, on paper. Yeah, so I, that's I my think, opinion. Uh, no, it won't. It doesn't help in that <laughs> aspect at all. Okay. Uh, what I've been thinking of recently is a do and don't list of writing binding guide. Um. So, um, oh. yeah, um, DTS is interesting, right? It's, it's an interesting language. It's, it's pretty much string parsing into a binary format. It's completely untyped. Everything is free form and we're, instead of adding typing, we're choosing to document the types and, and running checkers based on that, which is a large step forward. And I know that it has a converting little it to a type language or something like that is going to be a much steeper hill to climb. So this is 
definitely an improvement. Yeah. DTS has typing, DTB does not. There's yeah, a little bit of sync. Well, sort of, but yeah. Purely rhetorical question, but I've been waiting to ask for five years. Will there be an automatic translator to ACPI? <laughs> I'm sorry, what is ACPI? You, for, you forgot to attach a patch. <laughs> All right, other questions? So moving on, uh, so kind of what are the goals of using, of schema and use, using JSON schema in particular? Um, so we want to define a DT schema language that's uh, human readable, uh, human friendly, machine readable, um, and includes all the binding documentation. Um, we want better tooling to validate uh, DTS files at build time, not, uh, it's not the kernel's job to validate your DT. Yeah. Um, Susie. Um, question, um, what type of validation are you going to be using on the schema? Have you been thinking about that already or not? What? For validating the schema. So schema has, uh, I'll get into that on the next slide, I think. Okay. Uh, I know, that's why I'm asking. It's schema all the way down. Uh, I'm, I'm having a difficulty doing uh, And we want to leverage uh, existing technology. Um, I don't want to write a schema language and write a do long document describing that schema language. I want to use something that's already there. Uh, and I'm lazy, I don't want to write a lot of code either. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's, some, there's a desire to also be able to generate the specification documentation from the schema docs. Um, that's Grant's wish, so Grant's gonna do that part. <laughs> <laughs> Comment, Rob, back on that slide. Huh? On, my, on my wish list in the tooling, when the device resource has been validated by the validation subsystem, I'd like in our brand new FTT format to have confirmation that that actually was confirmed and then the kernel could choose to refuse to load it without that, or <laughs> it might be a little bit more friendly and just warn you that you weren't validated. Currently, if the kernel doesn't build, the C compiler fails, you can't right. load that kernel. So it's kind of that same concept I want to try and push toward the device tree as well. Practically speaking, it, people are just gonna hack the DTB yeah. to set that flag and it becomes useless. If we're gonna do that, we have to do runtime validation. That's the if only people, way to make that worthwhile. If, or people, how do you validate people, the bootloader People changes? could hack the yeah. ELF files too. I mean, I, I'm not too concerned. If people do that, that's their problem, and they're on their own. So I, I don't, what I don't see is I, if, I'm not, if you're going to fail the validation. About malicious at, actors. Yeah, sure. If you're going to fail the validation at build time, just don't don't allow the DTB to be built rather than setting the flag. There's no point having the flag. The, uh, there is no one that that benefits. Mm. Do a WR essentially. Yeah. Mike. How about overlays? How about, how about changing things dynamically? Uh, how can we validate those without having runtime uh, validation? That's actually a really naughty question, K-N-O-T-T-Y. <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there are a few approaches to it. One is that you would actually have the base source and the overlay source and validate them as a whole. And that runs into all kinds of problems with the number of possible permutations, how the heck do you do that? Um, one solution that's been suggested is to do runtime validation in the kernel, which I think has a whole another set of complexities and issues. But yeah, that, that's a real interesting question that, that we really need to deal with, with with the overlays when we get further into overlays. Just make sure that we, we don't preclude, a, I'm, I'm hearing, uh, you know, that we don't want to do runtime validation, but I think runtime validation is going to be required in that situation. It, it may end up being required. I, I really, really hope it's not just because of the extra complexities. But, but if, it, if it is, it is. You know, that's, 
whatever reality is. And if, if you're Trump's. talking user space applying overlays, then you can do all that in user space. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, good point. Um, to some extent, very limited, not schema based. We already, like, with FPGA Manager, look at properties of overlays that come in with a notifier. I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later. But so that would be a way where you could plug a runtime validator and then just reject the overlay if it doesn't pass whatever tests we put there. So going back to Mark's point, uh, I think it was, so one problem with just erroring out is that there's thousands of warnings and a lot of it's not critical. And we could split it between errors and warnings, but um, most of it is just defining more rules around uh, what, what the bindings should look like and what the overall tree structure should look like. And my suggestion that the kernel might not choose to load a, an overlay with errors. When you're developing, you actually might want to. You might have an overlay that's partially good, and all the, the sections that you care about for your current development task are good enough. So we definitely would need an override if the kernel was, was being prescriptive. All right, so current uh, status of where I'm at on, on this. Uh, so we're using uh, JSON schema draft six. Um, there's, they're up to, I think draft seven is out and working on draft eight already. Um, uh, schema docs are in YAML format, so they're not actually JSON, uh, but it's a JSON compatible subset, uh, YAML. Um, comments is one big one and it's generally deemed more human readable. Um, it's also, we have one schema per file. Um, this is, this has come up that we, YAML could support multiple uh, schemas in one file, uh, but JSON generally does not and it breaks the schema ID to file name mapping. Uh, DTC already now supports YAML output. Um, that went in uh, about a month or two ago now. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, completely undocumented, subject to uh, change. Uh, don't use it as a fixed format. Um, so the tools are written in Python 3 using uh, YAML parser and JSON schema modules, uh, and that's the link to the repo. And that has the meta schema, which is what validates the, the schema. Uh, it has some uh, core schema in there as well, and some, some uh, test uh, cases. Uh, so you can install this uh, with pip, just one step. Uh, it's been tested by as far as I know by me. Um, and then repeating. Uh, so I've also been working on integrating this into the kernel build uh, so it can validate the docs. It and then it can also uh, do DTS validation with the schema. Uh, I've converted some of the schema. Uh, well, there's the core schema in the YAML uh, bindings project. And then I did a bunch of ARM board level bindings. Uh, and then a, a, a few other cases. Uh, and I have a tool that kind of can extract the binding document and, and build the initial uh, Schema doc, it's not perfect, but it's more than nothing. Um, we can validate support for uh, sized properties and p handles. Um, 
that required a few extensions to the schema language. Um, but that's really the only place we've uh, defined our own schema keywords. And I've also had to do a lot of work to get the build time to be reasonable. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's not fast, but it's not uh, terribly slow now. And, uh, but we also have like, uh, I don't know, 50 schema that are applied and not 3,000. Hey, Rob. Have we considered uh, taking the, um, an alternate build path for validation of the schema so that the, the normal build for the kernel doesn't actually do the schema validation? So, <laughs> so good question, because uh, yes. So th this, <laughs> this is the build flow. Currently, it, it is uh, completely to the side of the normal build. Um, because for two reasons, it slows it down, and and secondly, it adds lots of warnings. And, um, and DTC does the same thing, adding warnings, but we turn those off by default. And um, I have I didn't really want to do that here. But, uh, so, kind of the the first dependency is that all the schema or files or binding docs, so which can be both from the green that's in the, uh, the kernel or the core schema that are in the yellowish. Those are all validated against the meta schema. The meta schema kind of limits what is, what we allow for within the schema documents, um, which is a subset. And, hopefully constrain stuff enough that uh, you can only write a valid uh, JSON schema. Because it's kind of easy to write stuff that's not valid and uh, a feature of JSON schema is that it, uh, if it doesn't understand a keyword, it ignores it. And it's also uh, case sensitive. So you run make uh, DT binding check that builds, uh, checks all the schema docs and builds a process schema. Um, so that's for two reasons. One is we do a bit of post processing on the schema to, to uh, add some additional properties in that um, are not the default for uh, JSON schema, but we generally want to be the default on uh, uh, for bindings, and that's basically array sizes, how many, how many elements you have. Uh, the default is you can add more, and it's still valid. Uh, we want it to be fixed, and so we fix that up. And uh, also the YAML encoding is, um, which I think is in the next slide, always, uh, like encodes even a single int as a matrix, um, so a one by one matrix, and so we fix that up so it's the binding doc uh, just uh, de defines an int and we fix it up to be a one by one matrix. <coughs> so then the process schema file is generated, then uh, you can run uh, make DTBs check uh, which runs DTC and generates from uh, DT dot DT dot YAML file, which is the YAML encoding of the DTS, built DTS. Uh, then runs that through the uh, validation tool and uh, dumps out a bunch of warnings. So what does the YAML encoding look like? Um, so it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's supported in DTC. It's, it's kind of an intermediate format. Um, so the kind of 
unusual things are strings are always an array or lists, and scalars are always a matrix. Um, and then the DTS bracketing uh, is also maintained uh, through the through the tool chain. And, and that's probably going to require DTS changes to make those correct uh, if we want to tighten that up. And I think there's, and, and it also outputs the uh, type tags, like the, you see the last property um, is a P handle with uh, cells or without cells. And then for size properties, you have the the bang uh, U8 or U64. Question? I noticed in the example that the scalar matrices have groupings that kind of encompass the type. Is, does that grouping come from the schema file? Or how does it infer how to group things in the arrays? So, uh, Say in an yeah. example where it has one member and then a second array so of that, three members. So DTS only allows basically in that form. Because you can only have a, the YAML format could support different size types within a property. But we in DTS we only support a single size for a property. So, so Okay. So that that's the example of the of the greater than less than brackets being maintained. So in that case, the first interrupt has one interrupt cell, and the second interrupt has three interrupt cells. So so this is this is a case where we would like to have a bunch of type information from DTS, but the information is just not there, yeah. right? Because we always we adopted years back just straight out DT and the, um, the byte encoding. Uh, that followed through to DTS, and DTS is missing the information that we need. So for example, interrupt cells, it well, would it, make it, sense. It may be missing the information. The, some of the it information It may is, be missing that information, is, you're right. Is, can, can be contained so, with this bracketing. Some of it we have. So like interrupt cells, it would make sense for interrupt, found interrupt cells to be just a bare two, right? Yeah. But we don't have that information in the DTS without encoding what the actual value is. It would be nice to move to that, but we don't have that information now. Um, interrupts, like with the 10 and then the 3 cell 1110, we've got that information in DTS because they're grouped with the angle brackets. There's nothing enforcing that, but it is there, so let's use that information and then make the schemas depend on that. Uh, this is actually a place where we can start getting more type information into DTS once the schemas are there because we can potentially go backwards and go the other, if we define new syntax in DTS to define the typings, to define the groupings, put it into the schema and then use the schema to reinterpret the DTS and put that information back in. Uh, but it does require DTS changes to get the kind of type information that we really would like to have. And I actually have a patch for DTC that will uh, give you warnings if, if the bracketing is wrong. In the cases it can detect, which are like the interrupt cells, it can see if those bracketing uh, line up. It's, it's also why some of the YAML encoding is kind of ugly. Uh, for example, interrupt cells being uh, nested in two arrays, or um, like strings are always in a in a list. When sometimes a property just wants a string, there's no there's never going to be a list there, and it would be nice to differentiate between the two. Right? Compatible will always be a list, but uh, a model should only always be just a string. Okay, so what does the schema doc look like? This, um, this is the, uh, the top level uh, keys of what's in the schema doc. Um, and all but the ones with asterisks are uh, standard JSON schema vocabulary words. Um, 
So we've, we've added uh, maintainers and select. Um, so kind of the first, the first two, uh, well, ID is a URI to, uh, it's basically a unique identifier. Um, right now it's uh, HTTP uh, colon slash slash device tree dot org slash schemas slash something. Um, there's not, if you go to that URL, there's nothing there. It's just kind of convention. Um, some people, I think, use this file, colon slash slash, but it, it, it can't, the validators can uh, do lookups based on actual URLs, but uh, we're not using that in the tool. Basically rewrites the path when it does referencing to other schema docs. Uh, schema is just what meta schema this, the schema adheres to. So um, this is this points back to the meta schema and the uh, uh, for the YAML bindings project and title description. Uh, generally, my tool that extracts uh, from the from the uh, binding documents can extract these out. The, as well as uh, does some finding out maintainers, not very well though, and it can extract examples out usually, and that's about it. Um, the meat of it is the properties or and pattern properties optionally, um, which is the kind of the list of all the properties for a binding. So within the property schema, the next level is you have the list of all the property names. Um, and this is the primary part of what's used for validation. Uh, you can also recurse down in more levels and you can have child nodes, uh, a child node defined by its name and it's just a property. Uh, or it could be a, a it can also be a pattern property if it has a unit address, for example. Uh, then you define properties again under that for child node properties. So what's required in each property depends on what class of property is. Is it a common property like reg or interrupts or is it a uh, Binding specific uh, property, uh, then it then it looks a little different. And generally, it requires a reference to back to the core schema, and we have types defined there for for that. So here's two examples of what uh, some common property examples would look like. Um, so clock frequency is uh, what is kind of older binding for clocks. Uh, and here we're just defining it's between uh, 100 and 200 hertz. Um, we don't need to say that it's a, a uh, integer because the core schema uh, does that for you. And then with uh, reg, uh, so in this case, we have two register ranges, um, and it's a list of items. And the main thing we need to know here is that it's two items and what they are in order. So it, the the number is kind of implied from how many items are in your list, and then the the post processing adds min items and max items uh, if there's not a min items or max items. And if you need, a, if you have cases where it needs to be variable, then you put those in and give the range of how many items. And for a vendor property, um, 
So these typically uh, are done in a way where you're uh, subclassing the base class. Um, and the way you do that in JSON schema is using the all of uh, keyword. And that's a list of schemas under it. And one is a reference to the base type. Um, and then the next one is the finding specific constraints. And then uh, the meta schema requires that uh, vendor properties have uh, descriptions, so we have a description here. And then a string property is very similar. There's uh, many more examples in the both the the kernel uh, uh, schema that I've converted and in the in the YAML bindings project. Questions on this? This is the guts of what people have to write. So uh, some some gotchas of what I've learned uh, in my uh, months of learning uh, JSON schema uh, and Python too. Uh, so YAML is the one, kind of one downside I've found is it's uh, indentation sensitive and doesn't like tabs. So it's kind of like make files in Python combined. Is there a linter that should be used here? Uh, I don't think there is one. Um, I've written a tool called YAML format uh, that does uh, some of that. Um, that's in the YAML bindings project. And So the other things, JSON schema keywords are case sensitive and then combined with that the validator handling of unknown JSON schema keywords is to ignore them. Uh, if you, you get the case wrong on all of, it will silently ignore it normally. Uh, that should get caught by the meta schema. And uh, some validators can have modes to uh, warn you on that, but unfortunately the uh, Python one does not. Uh, I, I was just wondering if, we're, if we can get the RUAML one uh, to start behaving that way, uh, but you just answered that question. Uh, and in, uh, one question that's come up on the reviews that of what I've sent out is uh, like for reg and reg names, can we, how do we say that they have to be the same size? Um, that's not easily expressed. Um, uh, generally data is not dependent on other data in JSON schema. Uh, there's some work uh, upstream in the specification to address that. Um, next slide. I, and, Next slide, I have how it would look if you wanted to do it. And it's not very pretty. Uh, the other thing is using the all of, one of, any of operators um, results in vague error messages. Um, and we're kind of using those in a lot of places. And it's only uh, one binding per doc, so some of the docs will probably have to be reorganized. Um, this has come up before uh, my talk at Connect on this. Uh, so we could support more in YAML because you can do multiple YAML docs in, in a single document, but then that would break how the uh, reference handling works where it, it looks at the ID to, to get the path to the your reference if it's not a full path. 
So what's the relationship between uh, JSON and, and YAML? Uh, YAML is a superset of JSON. Um, and all the tags that you saw in, uh, in the DT YAML output or is, is uh, one example of what uh, YAML can do that JSON cannot. Um, and then JSON schema is really no relationship to JSON other than you typically write it in JSON, um, but it doesn't have to be. And there's other people out there using YAML as the document format. Anything to add there, Grant? So uh, both JSON and YAML encode or map quite nicely from the, the text format and the, the runtime format in memory when you're in Python or if you're in other, other languages. Um, a JSON file can always be read by a YAML parser. Uh, the, other, the converse is not true. When we're using JSON schema, it doesn't actually operate on JSON. Um, it's specified with the JSON format, but the, all the parsers, you load it in, you get the runtime, uh, in, uh, the, you get the runtime encoding or the runtime uh, flat, uh, uh, version of the uh, data, and then you run the JSON schema parser with the preloaded data that you're uh, checking and the preloaded schemas. So it doesn't matter if you're loading it from JSON or if you're loading it from YAML. As far as JSON schema is concerned, it's the same. Uh, but yes, as uh, Rob said, YAML gives us things that are really nice for ma maintaining these files uh, that JSON doesn't. Um, comments is one of them. Um, <clears throat> a little bit easier to work with the structure and the addition of type tags is very valuable. So that's why we chose y YAML instead of just going with JSON. Uh, JSON was designed for uh, basically a compiler to use it. It wasn't intended to be used by humans. It was an inter interchange format. It was literally output, input over the web kind of thing. YAML was designed as a human writable file as well. So, but yeah, backwards compatibility, of course, was always the thing. So it's, it's the right choice, basically. Yeah, uh, one of the things as, as a contributor, and, and we've seen this in many areas, we see it in drivers, we've seen it in DT bindings and things like this where somebody will start doing this. Um, the first thing I do at least is I look at, I try to look at what somebody else did, I mimic that for whatever I'm looking at doing, and when things are in flight like this, um, it's pretty common that people pick the wrong example and implement it based on something that was good a while back, but we have a good sort of golden standard now. Um, it would be a good opportunity to figure out how to um, communicate that a little better, like, hey, you're coming here, you're looking at, at implementing something for your binding, uh, take a look at this binding instead of that binding, because that binding is old, we haven't updated it yet, it's not, having a, having a good sort of fresh real-time way of, of discovering that would be useful before you write the patch. Th yeah. This came up before where we talked about maybe potentially embedding versioning uh, into, into the schema or into the bindings so that it would be something that could be checked. Uh, is that something that you've looked at recently, Rob? Well, so the, the, uh, the schema uh, key says what meta schema you are validating against. So if we get to the point that we need a V2, we would just use a new meta schema, and and we could. Yeah, but uh, that's the mechanics of it. It's more yeah. like as a maintainer, what do you prefer? How do you prefer it to look? What's your preference? Right. Um, it's harder to enumerate and and give that versions. I'll, I'll get back to you after we've converted hundreds of bindings. Okay. <laughs> I think I think we don't know yet, right? No, no, no. Of course, and and that's. Why it's important to communicate as you discover, hey, I really like this way of doing it. If you're doing a new interrupt control or whatever, think about it this way instead. Yeah. Okay, so going back to uh, how you do cross property dependencies, um, this is what it would look like if. Um, 
and how you would have to do it, and this would be the top level, um, and it's using if then else uh, schema, which was introduced in draft seven, which the Python JSON schema doesn't quite support yet, but I think they're close. Um, so this says if you have, if, if, and that schema is true, that properties contains, the property compatible contains a compatible string, uh, then apply the then schema, else apply the else schema. And, uh, um, so this, there's a lot of cases in, in bindings where, where we have properties that are, if it's this compatible, we have three clocks, and if it's this other compatible, we only have two clocks. Um, so in those cases, we may have to, to split it out. Or, or it, uh, the other way to do it is to use any of under the property, um, but then either case would be true for either compatible. So it's at least matching one of them, but it's not validating that it matches the exact compatible that the constraint is. Another ACPI question? No. Mike? Hola. So, so is the if then else part of the schema actually embedded in the runtime version of, of the DTB? Or no. is it just in the, just in the this compile is just in the, This would be a just in the document. Okay. And I'm not recommending that we do this. Keep no, 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 I guess. Because <laughs> then what, if you have two conditions and you need two if then else, you need a, you need a uh, all of above that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really clunky. <laughs> and this is way into speculation territory, but if we were looking to at some point do a runtime verifier when we load fragments and stuff like that, uh, it would sort of be neat not to embed a YAML parser in the kernel and then instead generate some code that will do it in, in C. Um, but I think we're far away from really worrying about that. Well, you, you can do uh, JSON schema in C. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it because, well, it maps well to Python because everything's a list or a dictionary. Yeah, but at the point where we have the schema, we might as well build the code in the kernel. We don't need to keep the schema around once we can verify it. There's also been talk through the years about, okay, so you have the binding. We should just be able to spit out a template for a driver out of this. Um, you know, <laughs> or pr the probing piecing of a driver. Piecing. I'm going to let someone else solve that one. I was, on that previous slide, I was going to say, if we've got like a list of, say, eight uh, compatible strings, and they've each got their own specific property, can that not be a dictionary in some form in that in a list, or is that hard to express? What? It, oh, that's why. <laughs> uh, if we've got a list of eight compatibles for our eight sub socks or whatever, that's going to grow horribly. But what we actually need, it, what it needs is just a, a dictionary key mapping. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, so th this is not the only way to do these kind of tests. This is, this is an example of what the if then else looks like, and there's places where you might want to do that. But if you have a large number of compatibles, you would probably set up, um, for this specific compatible, here's the schema of that it contains all within it. So the compatible contains a compat the string. And then right below that, you'd have the other things that are characteristic on that particular version. Uh, and then you can have a roll up of here's all the compatibles and the ones that it matches, it'll do take all of them. So you don't have to have this if then else um, structure in that case. So for variations of what compatibles you can have, it's, that's all within a property. Uh, so that's easy to do, and it's contained under properties compatible. Is that where you were yeah, getting at? Yeah, that's 
Yeah, it, it, and it does. And the cases where it grows is where their platforms have two or three or four compatibles and different combinations of that. And um, there's examples that I've converted already. I've sent this out, uh, I guess about a month ago now, of initial con kernel support and converting a bunch of board level findings. So there's examples of that in there. The, the whole compatible handling is, is painful enough that it probably makes sense defining our own keyword for dealing with the, the combinations of, okay, what order can compatible values be in and are you, is it, is it strictly doing that, right? Because without some of the prototypes that you put together uh, were just painful. Wildcard, yeah. So right, to be able to have a list and say it must contain these ones, but it must also be in the, in the right order, which JSON schema doesn't currently. Yeah, it does. It do, does handle that now? Okay. So. I thought we had problems with uh, um, you know, the questions of so if there I, was something. The items keyword can either be a schema or a list. If it's a schema, it applies to all the items. Um, and like if you do a enum as a schema, all those items, you can this have to match any of the item. Yeah, but I, I, I thought we had the problem. The, yeah. There's the problem of if you have something that is um, extending that binding. So you've got so an NS16550 binding. If you were to have another binding that was compatible with NS16550, and you had done that in the NS16550, that would no longer work. That would no longer match because you've got additional stuff in there and the list items don't line up anymore. Yeah. It sounds like an offline question. <laughs> yeah. I think we're fine there, because I think uh, we just, the constraint there would be that you just have a contains for the 16.550 and 16.550 binding, and then in your more specific case, you, you say it's, it's uh, TIU art, and then it's a, uh, 16550. Uh, so how do you run all this? Um, uh, so you can install from pip, as I mentioned. Um, the kernel of DTC also has the, has been updated with the YAML support. You just need lib YAML and the uh, headers for it to for that to get turned on when it builds. Um, make all mod config will turn on building all DTS files. Um, and then make binding check, or you can skip that and just run make DTBs check. Um, and since it does produce so many warnings, I've worked on being able to split what schema you run. And so you can run uh, only core schema, only kernel schema, only a specific uh, user specified schema. And that makes it easier to sort out uh, errors one by one. So kind of next step, uh, please go review the my patch series, uh, and I'm going to send out another version uh, hopefully soon. Uh, I'd like to add this, the build support uh, at least in 4.21. Um, it's all of about 70 lines, and it's outside of the normal build flow. Uh, I've converted some bindings, not a whole lot of feedback on them. Um, Mostly people uh, complain that I dropped some comments. Um, and there's not yet a requirement to submit bindings in JSON schema. And there's already uh, thousands of warnings generated. Um, I'm, the problem, the problem it also faces in DTC is kind of how you build uh, 
DTBs is, uh, you know, you include a base DTS, uh, uh, base uh, SOC DTSI file, and that file probably has the warning in it, or the source of the warning, and then you include that in, uh, say, 10 board files, uh, but the error output prints out the DTB name, uh, or in this case, the dt.yaml name. Uh, so you have to trace it back into the, where the source file is. This is soon gonna be fixed in DTC, uh, but it, the result is it generates lots of duplicate warnings. Um, so one thing I was thinking there is we need a uh, build of uh, option to just build uh, SOC DTS files without the uh, top level board, all, all the top level board ones, so we can kind of reduce the number of warnings. Okay, um, once you're ready to actually start the conversion, um, have you started, uh, in terms of actually, this has gotta be a divide and conquer type of story here. So have you been putting some thought into putting some orientation information and how to's in place so that you can then push that to people who own the files that have to be converted and then try to get them engaged effectively? Um, I would guess a lot of the bindings are somewhat abandoned. That's probably the case, but I think asking the people who've but put them in the first place is a first step. Yeah. Seems to me to be a logical place. And we can get that information pretty easily by mining Git now these yeah. days. So my, my plan f of what I'll work on is more of the core side of the bindings, GPIO, and I've already done that. Right. So. I'm just, uh, yeah, if, if we want to shift, the if we, if we want to do a transition. The patch have a how to write a schema doc in, in the series. Right. I'm, okay. Like I say, I'm just, you know, so this doesn't just be another falter, like effort partially and then other things subsequent that as we've been going through, can we come up with an actual transition plan and then evangelize it and make sure that the right material is there? That's right. my ask. I, I'm hopeful that it's the meta schema restricts stuff enough and it's distilled down enough that it's not a huge learning curve to learn JSON schema, but that is one of my concerns. I just need people to start trying it and uh, get feedback to how we can uh, document it better and such. Uh, once we convert everything, it's gonna be slow, so we'll have to worry about that when we get there, I guess. But it's, uh, you're iterating over each node of each DT and deciding which schema to apply, so I don't, I'm not sure how you go faster. How do we sneak it in so that Linus doesn't think there's any churn happening? <laughs> How do we camouflage it? <laughs> it's uh, all under documentation and he doesn't care. I don't know. <laughs> we kind of open questions that I have, uh, what to do with the YAML bindings project. I think the options are keep it separate uh, I know Grant's in favor of integrating to DTC or, or integrate a subset of it into the kernel directly. I'm tending to leaning toward uh, keeping it separate for now so it can be iterated on um, more quickly. Uh, I go back and forth kind of on the model for the make targets, whether we should have separate targets uh, like I do now or do something more like when you build sparse. Uh, not sure, so any input there would be useful. Uh, another question that's come up is how to define class of devices. Um, so I had a couple options. I've basically decided that this is only good option. The others were like using path or coming up with some list of keywords that then get mapped back to a schema doc. Um, but I think the easiest, the most flexible is at the top level you can have an all of Q 
Wiki and just uh, include what a, what a, whatever other schema you want to include. And I don't think we need this on uh, all the common bindings like GPIO and clocks. I think that that already gets covered uh, and applied without doing this. Then another question is licensing. So all these binding docs we have have no license, so they're GPL2. Um, what do we do with that, if anything? Um, Personally, I'd like to be able to dual license them, but I also don't want to go get permission on everyone. Can we basically, as part of figuring out the transition plan, can we figure out the licensing and get the same things happening at the same time? And then anyone who doesn't want to deal with something, we just drop it and make someone feel some pain and fix it then. Definitely. I mean, if we're talking about embedding verifiers in the kernel, we want to allow others to do it without tainting. Yeah, dual license is going to be really important here. I think so. Which way are you leaning? Like, the question was, which way am I leaning for licensing? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was to leave it as GPL for now, but um, the YAML bindings part is is uh, BSD two clause. We can easily change that because it's ARM and Lenaro is copyright currently. I I don't think we're too worried about people forking and making proprietary versions of any of this. So <laughs> <laughs> whatever is, gets most people to the table, I'm I'm open for it. Uh, in so, some cases, I've instead of converting uh, some common bindings in tree, I've done them, uh, moved them into the the uh, YAML project, and I've gotten permission to relicense those. But that's like two files. <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, there's links to. Uh, the schema and tools repo and the kernel branch uh, with DT schema. Any more time for questions? Okay. Thanks. I'd just like to remind everyone that if you're not adding those to Etherpad, here's the URL. Uh, feel free to contribute. These notes will be valuable six months from now when we're trying to remember what the heck we talked about this week. Is anybody grabbing the URL or should I get rid of the slide now? Anyone want, want it to hold up? Okay, slide is gone. Uh, the next session is a joint one between Simon Glass and myself. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about what's happened in the kernel in terms of um, size of device trees. Simon's focusing more on U-boot and or flattened device tree. So we'll start with my slides. And I'm going to try to jump through a lot of my slides. 
they'll be there for reference. Um, but if I actually talked them through, I would actually spend a lot of time talking myself instead of you guys talking. Okay, fun and games, yeah. There, nope. Just have to get in the right workspace and I'll be fine. Nothing like a sliding mouse jumping you. There we go. Say put mouse. <laughs> um, so I'll start with some work that Rob did. This is just a reference of where to find some of his patches. He was focusing on reducing the size of the device tree data structures in the kernel, uh, specifically property structures and node structures. Um, one thing that's important to notice is that if config dynamic is selected, then the size reductions do not take place. If you're doing overlays, config dynamic is selected. So overlays do not gain the benefit of these size reductions. Um, so once he, he put these pa patches in place, Nicholas Peter did some, um, he's, he's doing some attempts to tinyify, tinyify the kernel. Feel free to ju jump in on this, Rob, at any point, because I'm talking about your stuff. Um, <laughs> so Nicholas reported some results, and he had a test system where he went from almost 120,000 bytes down to just over 20,000 bytes. So that's a significant size reduction for a memory-constrained system. And he's talking in very, very constrained systems. Um, there's a second feature in the device tree compiler that's out there now. You can add a notation in your source that tells the compiler, if this node is not referenced by any other node, say a p-handle reference, emit this node from the resulting compiled device tree. And then there's an, here's an example, just for reference. Um, and then Rob added another feature to shrink the size of the node um, data structure by removing the, the path from the, the full name. But now if you want to access that information, use percent %p o f. Typically this is used in error and warning messages. So if you're creating new messages, this is what you want to use. You don't want to use node, node full name. So Nicholas added these two next features and he got down to um, just under 12,000 bytes. So we went from roughly 22,000 down to 12,000 with this next step. So he, an incredible reduction from Rob's memory sizing stuff. On the other hand, we've increased memory use in a, in a few fashions. One is making nodes K objects. And, and that's a lot to do with tracking and freeing memory. And that ends up using a lot of space, unfortunately. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, that was the uh, main thing that got that re re reduction, was uh, making that optional again. Right. Because that's just right. used for uh, sysfs representation, which is linked to, uh, or proc uh, dev device tree links to. Right, right. The sysfs is the other half of, of what you gain from k objects, which is really nice. Um, so that would be if you're used to slash proc slash device tree showing the representation of what the device tree contains, that's what's now in sysfs. It's now a link into sysfs. Um, so if you want that, again, you're not going to get the size reduction. So it's useful in constrained systems, but you lose some features. You lose overlays. You lose proc device tree. Uh, P handle cache, we added a cache. Some people were complaining about the performance overhead of accessing large numbers of p-handles and doing the lookups. And so we added in the feature. There have actually been several requests for this. And, and finally, we said, OK, we've had enough requests for this. It, it really is a demonstrated need. But that adds some more space. And it's not too bad if you don't have too many p-handles. It's based on how many p-handles exist in the tree. And there's the formula for how large it is. 
I'm not going to talk about this slide unless we have time left over. We can bring it up in Q&A, but there are other opportunities thinking forward where we can try and, and shrink size. Um, one big area that I'm concerned about is when overlays are used in the kernel, the base device tree has to have symbolic information that's used when you load the overlay. And it turns out that that adds a lot of size to the, the flattened device tree and to the in-kernel memory usage. So um, I, I did a, a bit of prototyping to shrink that, that memory size, and I had a second motivation. I really don't like that the metadata is sitting in the namespace that all the other nodes and properties are in. That metadata just looks like it's a node or a, a set of nodes, which there are issues with that. Um, the side effect is we need a new flattened device tree format if, if I make these changes. Just looking at, this is a really busy slide, just looking at this top box, this is um, the worst device tree in the Linux kernel, in the ARM um, subtree right now, in terms of added overhead for that base um, device tree for the symbols. So currently, if you compile with symbols, you go from 90,000 bytes, you add 42,000 more bytes just for the symbols. My prototyping, I got it down to only 15,000, 16,000 additional bytes, so saving almost 27,000 bytes. So there's significant potential to go to a different format and reduce the overhead of, of these symbols. And this is just a graph. I looked at every single device tree in the ARM subtree. So every point on the horizontal axis is one of the device tree sources compiled. What is the, the two lines are one is, what is the overhead with the current methodology? That's the top green line. The bottom line is my prototype reduced size how much memory is used for the extra symbols metadata. And you can see there, there's really not too big a problem until you get out to about 800 plus device trees. So th there are about 800 device trees where symbols are not a huge overhead. They're only up to, say, 1,500 bytes, 2,000 bytes, which isn't horrendous unless you're really, really constrained. But all of a sudden, in that last 100 to 150, it mushrooms. So there are a handful of device trees that are, are really problematic, such that I'm not willing to just turn on symbol information for all compilers of all device trees blindly, because there are, there, there are the problem ones, and we just don't want to incur that overhead. Yeah, question. Uh, of those uh, ones on the graph there, um, are they architectures that are uh, very constrained, the ones that have I, that real I blow up? I did not do that analysis. Um, I, I would assume not, because if they're constrained, they don't likely have many devices. Yeah, I, I'd also wonder to what extent some of that blow is coming from ones that are not maintained anymore. Right, I, I don't know. I, in my email thread, I actually d sent out a list by device tree what the sizes were. Okay. So that's out there on the mail list. If, if you want to, anyone wants to look at specific device trees. Um, and this was just a prototype. In actual implementation, depending on how we end up, we'll have different numbers. But, but this gives a really good sense, I think, of, of what is achievable and what's reasonable. Um, just some more stuff. Okay. <laughs> Questions? I'm trying to be really brief on this and not spend too much time. No questions, if Simon, if you want to come up. Pardon? Yeah. I mean, if, if we're talking about a new device tree format, and this has come up occasionally over the last number of years, um, the encoding as it is right now is really naive. Uh, and so there's a lot of wasted space already. So if we're looking at a new device tree uh, binary format, it can really reduce the size of, uh, there's other places we can reduce the size as well. I'm not sure Frank is I, I don't think Frank's listening. Frank's not paying attention. But that's okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> if you could repeat it again, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Frank's paying attention. 
break. We can pick up after the break. We should fire Frank. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I got distracted. Uh, I had just commented that there's a lot of other opportunities for reducing the size of the DTB files. Uh, but then I saw the title of Simon's slide, so I want to see what this is. Yeah, yeah, and he actually has some, some interesting ideas. And when we get to the DTB format session later in the track, we'll, we'll be talking also in, in more detail. Hi. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about a, I mean, if we did change the format, we would want to do it once and get everything done at once, right? Because it's a huge job. I'm not too sure if it's feasible. But uh, I just basically wanted to throw out some ideas about things we could do um, based on things, my experience with it and some of the pain that I've had. Um, so here's my wish list. <coughs> So is that ambitious enough? I figured there's more things that could go on it. And some of these are easy and some of them are hard. Is this a pointer or not? Yeah, top button. Top button. Cool, OK. Um, some, of, some of these you may not have seen. This is the ability to pull the stuff out of another node into this current one. I think YAML does something similar to that. Um, this is being able to reference data outside the DT because, for example, the fit format, if you're familiar with that, that you boot users, um, you end up with this massive device tree. You really want the metadata at the front and the files outside somewhere else. It's actually implemented in U-Boot, but we could put it in the system. This would be cool for speed. I don't know. Anyway, that's my list. So um, I think it would be good to keep the basic structure and make it efficient to directly walk through. So. We don't have to. We won't have to go to having to use a live tree to do anything with it, um, and ideally not too much code. Keep the tools the same, and can we just hack a couple of files and maybe get somewhere? So this is what I came up with. Um, just tell me when to stop. We can continue after the break or, or whatever. So yeah, okay. Yeah, if I if I I probably probably run out of slides by then. I'll try and be quick. Um, so yeah, the, the tag cells are wasteful because they're 32 bits and we only, have, only really use a few of those bits. Um, so I thought, well, maybe we can reuse them for something else. Um, so what I came up with was two types of tags, basically um, a property one and then one for everything else. Um, the property one's where all the action is, but uh, we, we, we subdivide them that way in order to get the maximum number of bits. Um, and then try and include everything in that single cell, all the metadata that we have at the moment. So you think about the prop struct. It's uh, got a, uh, a tag, it's got a name pointer or name integer, it's got a length, and then the data starts. So try and get those three cells down to one. Um, I thought this would be nice, get rid of the compatible strings. They're really slow and big are they? And then leave everything else alone. And in other words, this only affects the struct uh, portion of the device tree. So this is just, I, I thought, well, it, this is all very well to talk about this, but unless it's a bit more real, um, it's, you know, it's all but pie in the sky. So I actually tried to come up with what that format might be. Um, this, is, this is just some ideas. Um, this is the bit that tells you whether it's a property or not. And then we've got a type here. Um, We've got scalars and lists, so we just support, uh, so we can tell whether it's a list or not. Signed, unsigned, the external business. Uh, we can encode a single byte in the, in the same thing, if, if it's a single byte. Seems to save a little bit of space. Some of these are more useful than others. Um, text comment. Um, I think that if you're trying to get exactly the source that you put in, that would, want, would be one way to do it. I don't know how useful that is. 
hexadecimal length of the property and then the string table. So these are these big fields over here. Um, so basically, with that single cell, you can encode um, all the metadata for property. So is it crazy enough yet? And then uh, the non-property tag uh, is al along the same lines. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a zero meaning non-property. We have these different tag types, including things like delete node and merge node and so on. And uh, we also have the ability to specify the offset to the next uh, node at the same level or previous node of, this, of the same level for begin and end. That lets you traverse the tree quickly. At the moment, there's a pathological case where you try and find the parent of a node in a flat tree and it takes forever because you've got to go and scan from the beginning of the tree every time. So um, that would fix that. Um, and um, the... I thought, well, okay, let's see, let's see how far, how big this would be. What, how would we, um, you know, evaluate this? Um, so I used the Linux device trees. So about 32 megabytes of data um, from 8K to 83K, and so it comes down to about. If you compress them just with this compression tool, uh, it comes down to five, about five megabytes, which gives you an idea of the entropy. If you know what I mean, like you know, it gets it gives you some sort of thing. And another s another test of that is that the source file is compressed down to a similar size, right? So that sort of gives you, you know, there's some amount of actual information there. Um, but I'm nowhere near that um, with my with my tests. Um, basically, I can get something like a 40% size saving on the flat tree um, with the things that I've done. There's about um, so now's a good time to stop if if we wanna if we wanna stop. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something fundamental here, but um, can load actually compressed DTB. What's that? Sorry. Based on the, based on the compression ability, why why are we not just switching over to supporting? loading of compressed DTBs instead, if it buys us more? Oh, we should do both. The, the thing is, this is to reduce the actual size and memory of the... Actual runtime, right? Okay, yeah, the okay, runtime. Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, at least in SPL, it's, you know, pretty... I think it's, uh, it's a big problem to have it, you know, too big. And we're already trying to avoid, you know, things like the pin control stuff to save space. Okay. As for, as for using a compressed DTB directly, um, we really don't want to have to do it in really early boot code because you don't have enough space to decompress it because you need to read the DT to figure out where your memory is to find the buffer of the app. So we, we want it to be directly readable from the outset in the kernel. Uh, if you're actually building a product, having a bootloader decompress it uh, to launch the kernel, but yeah, it doesn't solve it for the early boot. Yeah. But I mean, you could do that today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. Yeah. yeah. So the only other comment I make is that uh, it's kind of annoying uh, amount of work. Uh, the, I think the code changes like, to get this far. So where I've got it to is sorry. Yeah. Sorry. All right, so we're going to come back and pick up uh, with Simon um, in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I forgot. Uh, so try and come back in about 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to take a break and, and come back in. They should have uh, 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think I, I was basically finished. Um, Check, one, two. I just wanted to show this table. This is um, from my experiments for think how much impact these, each of these things has. Um, so you can see the saving column there. Having a single cell property for metadata saves quite a lot. Um, and replacing compatible strings um, saves quite a bit. 
Uh, and that's, I get to the 40% by um, adding up B, D, and G. So that's the single cell properties, the um, in-place bite, and the compatible springs. So I, I wanted to ask, how annoying would it be to use a, how feasible would it be to uh, use product ID, vendor ID, instead of a compatible string? A little bit like is done with PCI or something. <laughs> Anyone want to surface, comment on this? On the surface, it sounds like a big change, but if we're doing a, a, an FDT format changeover, then every single device tree is going to need to get recompiled anyway. And it seems like we could fairly well automate the compatible conversion. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you've got the vendor comma thing. Yeah. How would we assign IDs to manufacturers who maybe haven't paid their money to the PCI people? You get to answer the question. <laughs> So I, I wasn't saying it has to use the same as PCI, well, but it's the obvious thing to use, but, yeah. but uh, it doesn't have to be. I mean, th th there you is could just do it with patches to the kernel. I yeah, mean, I, uh, there is the option that uh, everybody uses for ACP, which is to use Intel's vendor ID, um, because when Intel puts something on a reference board, they assign one of their own IDs to it, even if it comes from another money. Uh, even if it comes from another manufacturer, and then everybody keeps on using those. So there's something, there's options like that where we just get a generic ID of our own and uh, from somewhere uh, like the Loans Foundation, and then start assigning numbers in there. I, I'm a big fan of first in gets the first number, and then just go from there. Then, the, then there's no, you know, baggage for somebody else's numbering. System yeah. call. System yeah, call another. But, yeah. But, um, yeah, but that, that, that then makes merge issues and people doing stuff out of tree. Uh, you know, you've not upstreamed your driver, you need to sign an ID, you assign the next number. So does your competitor and your competitor and... It, it is a good point. Then we end up having to arbitrate ID number fights. Yeah, and I was going to say that the issue of out of tree, out of Linux tree, device trees. There are oh. just so many of them out there. But I mean, it doesn't look like the size savings is really that great, so what are we trying to do? Yeah, I mean, the, thing, the reason I'm interested in this as well is for efficiency. You know, in SPL, comparing strings is just, is just pretty, it's kind of dumb to be doing it, arguably. Um, well, and one, one thing we'd also need is not just vendor and product, but we need, like, sub-product or sub-device, because well, you have... We get away with it with PCI and USB, right? Well, you're looking at, you have one top level ID there, uh, but we need, um, we have top level IDs for board, SOC, uh, and then the block IDs for every single block on the chip. Yeah, yeah, that's right, there are a lot. It, it, is it just a case of matching the strings is hard or expensive? Yeah. Can it's it be expensive. hashed in any way, or is it? It's or expensive, it's slow, it's yeah. kind of very human friendly, but we wouldn't do it. And PCI didn't do it that way, I don't know. <clears throat> I guess one other issue is for the Linux kernel, we have our compatible strings all over the source code as well, not just in the device resources. So that would be a, a real big churn there. And to maintain compatibility with two different versions of the the, the device tree spec would be real difficult in the drivers. Yeah, I guess, uh, I, I guess ultimately there's, there's a conversion table, right? So the, a kernel could have that, and then you'd have to have new API functions, I think, to, to deal with that case or a new, um, a new table format. So, yeah. Um, how would you deal with companies that can't get PCA IDs? Well, we, we talked about that a bit before. I think we just, um, we could allocate our own. Like just have a, have a table in the kernel. Okay. Um, I mean, this sounds pretty controversial. We probably should stop talking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... It, it's you got them talking, so <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually, the other question I wanted to ask people was, are there any other ideas for making it smaller? 
I mean, I guess a lot of kernel people don't really care about making it smaller uh, anyway. Is that true? The flat tree? Because you just compress it or get the bootloader to decompress it. Uh, one thing that we could do is start dropping uh, nodes that are disabled with status disabled. But right. sometimes the bootloader is what turns those on. And right. Uh, yeah, CPU I mean, nodes are a little different in how they work. Yeah. Uh, that seems like an obvious thing to do, so long as you don't then need to enable them later. So, uh, so, and, so and sorry. sorry. That's actually what we do in the kernel. Uh, it's it's hidden behind an option. I forget. I think the OF dynamic option uh, that if the node's disabled, we don't unflatten it. Right. So while the kernel may not be as quite sensitive to it, Zephyr is going to be very sensitive to it. We're using device tree in Zephyr. And so we'll probably want to make sure we can keep these things as small as possible. But the device tree is not on in the image. It's it's Oh, no. It's used, compiled. It's a binary. It's, binary. Yeah. it's used to generate right, the, the headers and, and such out of the device tree. It's not on the device binary, unless it's changed. Yeah. Yes. The question was, was he talking Zephyr specifically? Rob said yes. I, I was going to make a comment earlier and just skipped, but I guess now I should mention there really are a lot of communities involved here. We're sitting here in a Linux room, but we have a project which is the device tree compiler itself. Uh, David Gibson and John, I never know how to say, Lolliger. Low, low um, there are the various bootloaders that use it. Um, there's Zephyr, as Kate just mentioned. Uh, there's some BSDs using it. I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't other people. Any, anyone else know of other projects using it? Yeah, bootloaders. Tiano Core. I think those are the main ones that I know of. Yeah, so that's a bit of a challenge. It's, it's hard to reach out to all those groups because they don't come to a Linux conference. <laughs> and I, I don't know of any good venue. Well, well Zephyr does, but, but the others. And, well, and you boot people do. You boot too. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of them. Getting all of them together in one room has is, been is a challenge. Yeah. yeah. The best bet for those are probably the ELCs and the ELC Europe's so far. <laughs> so um, one thing I will say is that uh, some of these can be done, some of these changes can be done with just libftt updates and some do actually need API chain, a, a new function or something. The one, the compressing, putting uh, single cell met property metadata, once you do that, you actually can't use things like, uh, you know, the, the get property function that returns a struct. Um, you have to have one that returns separate things, um, which I actually think is a better API anyway. Uh, I think the current one where you have to you know, to change the Indianness and so on is kind of dumb. Um, but it does allow get prop to work. Um, so most of the API stays the same. And so things like U-Boot, for example, wouldn't care too much. They would, ju would just continue to work. Yeah, if, if I can weigh in on the API that returns pointers to our data structures. And by our data structures, I mean device tree core internal data structures, the device tree. I think those create a lot of problems. And the one that I've really been running against is for overlays. Um, once somebody has a pointer into an internal data structure, I have no idea whether that pointer remains live when someone goes to release the overlay. So use after free becomes a real concern for me. And if we could get rid of all the APIs that return pointers yeah. to our internal structures, we could solve that. But that's a major change impacting drivers and core code. Yeah, um, but I totally agree. I think there's, there needs to be more separation between it. I can see how it ended up that way for efficiency reasons, maybe. Yeah, but plus it might actually use more memory because you end up copying <laughs> data and returning the copy to the, the caller who wants to see the, the value. So there's the downside. In addition to the memory overhead, there's also going to be an additional CPU overhead as well. So there's performance hit on both of those. And then read the sheet you're on. Sure. I, on, the comment was only on read, which is true. Okay. 
Any, anything else people want to say? Uh, other than here, where else have you published this, the, this proposal? Published? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, this is just, I, I, I've been playing around doing some experiments the last few weeks. Uh, I actually, I, as I mentioned before, I dropped off the mailing list because somehow the ping told me it was uh, bouncing or something. So oh. I, I actually did a bit of reading and found that some people had done some things already. So, ranks and so on. So, um, yeah, and no, I haven't published it anywhere. I mean, I know it's a little bit crazy, but I just thought we'd just sort of start the, you know, st start with everything and see how it goes. Certainly, it's a good conversation starter, and it would be useful to to begin to at least socialize it a little bit, get comments. I mean, the impact on something like get property in terms of the dry, how wide that is, uh, right. the the potential impact of moving away from compatible strings. Uh, as well, uh, I'm pretty sure that we'll, we will hear plenty of comment. Um, so uh, we, we should probably at least start throwing it out there and get some other thoughts. Uh, the other one uh, that uh, comes to mind just uh, all of a sudden is um, things like for the, the DMA uh, bindings, uh, transmit and receive, which, which uh, uh, DMA is being used in which direction. So there are strings being used there, which again, probably are overkill. Yes. No, that's a, that's a good point. And it's a, it's a separate uh, property altogether, too. So. Right. Yeah. I think that the I, I actually got all excited and thought pin control was going to be a big saving, but most of the SOCs on on the ARM side don't actually use strings for that, or is, you know not a lot of strings. But I think Samsung does. Um, and I actually did I do that? Oh, maybe. Uh, I don't know whether it was on that thing or not, but. Um, the, I did actually look at it. It didn't make that much difference, even for Samsung, for the ultimate size. So I thought, oh well. I'm just thinking that that there's there's probably bindings with that that could be tightened up uh, for ne next gen versions that that would uh, even get rid of properties altogether and just add directionality into the uh, into the tuple itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, and I, while we're waiting for that, I did want to say um, I did present something a year ago about U-Boot SPL, and uh, this was uh, FTD grep, a thing that got rid of a lot of nodes that weren't used, uh, didn't need, weren't needed for SPL and so on. So for the Zephyr people, if you want to, if that's useful, I don't know. Um, it gets the device tree down to you know 3K for a rock chip. Thing, for example, from about 48k because we just throw away stuff we know we don't need uh, for the devices we have in SPL. All right, thank you, everyone. Strangely enough, we are right back on schedule. If you consider that to have been Q and A number two, <laughs> <laughs> so we can be flexible in our interpretations. Um, I'm going to jump through more than three slides, so some of these I'm going to jump through pretty quickly so I don't take a lot of time on them, leave more time for every, everything else, um, but they are there for reference. Uh, just a pointer to where I first started this discussion on the mail list back about a year ago. Um, the big thing I learned was, and I showed previously in the graph, there is significant space used by the overlay metadata for the symbol information. There, there is opportunity to save space. We saw the graph. Um, compatibility is real important. In the past, we've tried to be able to um, have compatibility between old versions of, of the flattened device trees and the code, you know, back and forth, depending on which is switching the code or the, the flattened device tree. This is a point where, um, given Simon's proposals and my proposals, I, I think this is going to be one of those breaks where there's not going to be compatibility. You have to have a very clear distinction of which version of software and which version of device tree you're using. We can try and maintain the compatibility. If we do that, we don't get as big a gain. We don't gain some of the features. Um, Simon mentioned the idea, for instance, of being able to delete a node. That's going to require a compatibility break. And, and just, I think there's going to be a lot of value to it. We, we can make that decision in the discussion. 
when, when we're actually trying to change it. But I, I'm hoping that people will go with the, the big hard break. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of different projects involved. We need to keep them all in the loop. Just a real quick, for people who don't know the actual internals of Device Tree, just enough to understand some of the, the context of what we've been saying and what we're about to say. Um, the Device Tree has a header block, which has pointers into sub-blocks within the, the flattened Device Tree, and a bunch of other things of various interest. So the structure block is where the actual nodes and properties tree structure lives and is described. And that'll be important on the next slide. And that covers a lot of what Simon's been talking about, is things in the structure block. The strings block is just a storage area for strings <coughs> referenced from elsewhere in the flattened device tree. It's just a table of strings. Um, one attribute of it is that it's byte aligned instead of four byte aligned. And there's some string reuse. If a substring is part of a, a larger string, then a reference can point into that substring instead of having to reallocate space to, to have that substring in two different places in the table. And finally, memory reserve map is another block you just get pointed to. Um, this is just a trivial source device tree. And then taking a tokenized version, just conceptually, what does that turn into when it's compiled? And then finally, what does it actually look like Kind of, it's, it's not hex or binary, but the equivalent of that. And I'm just going to look at a couple lines, but, but you can look at this later at home if you're curious. Uh, root node, oh, we have a key at the bottom which says what my little tokens are begin node, end node, begin property, end block. And Simon referenced these tags and hit when he was talking. So for the first node, root is special, it is begin node, it doesn't encode the name, let's ignore that. We come to our next node. Its name is, whoops, I have a typo, uh, NX. So we have a begin node token. That's a, each of these items here are a four byte or a multiple of four byte item, a cell. So we have a tag taking four bytes, a string, which should be NX there, <laughs> taking four bytes. And when we look at the actual dump, we'd see one, which is begin node, we'd see an N, a Y, and um, a string terminating zero and a padding zero because we have, we have that four byte alignment. Yeah, four byte alignment. Property, let's jump down to property two. We have our tag saying begin property and as Simon said, we have a, a field which tells us how long is the actual value held in that property. Then our name offset, that tells us where to go look in that strings block to find the actual name. And that gives us some deduplication uh, it gives us some space saving there. And then we actually have the value encoded in the property. So in this example of property two, we have our, our tag, begin property is three, our length is eight bytes of data, and then we have some magic offset into the, str into the strings block. Then we actually have our, our values. Two is a full four bytes, 99 is a full four bytes. So the reason I'm showing you this is to understand what you have to do when you're parsing, whether you're a bootloader, whether you're the kernel, you actually have to scan serially through the stream. And each time you hit an entry, you find out how big that entry is. So then you can look beyond that entry to find the next entry. And once you hit that entry, you decide how long that is. If we add a new type of entry, a new tag type, then existing code doesn't know how to skip over that entry and get to the next entry. So there's no way to maintain compatibility at the binary level when we start playing with tags. And these proposals that are really going to save us space and give us functionality are impacting our, our tags, adding tags or modifying. The Simon is proposing the format of, of those tags. And he's adding a lot of context, context into a single four byte tag. So that's a lot of what's driving the incompatibility that I think we're going to have to hit. Uh, this is just real quick saying when you actually have an overlay, it has metadata. It's currently sitting in three special types of nodes. It's very verbose. It has a lot of string data in there. It takes a lot of space to do that. My proposal prototype back in the beginning of the year converted each of these entries into a very, very small amount of space 
So for the symbols node, instead of having a long string, it was just two 32-bit um, values, which were essentially offsets into some of those other structures. For fix-ups, again, it was just two 32-bit values, again, pointing somewhere else in the, in the flattened device tree. For the local fix-ups, it was just a single value. So you can see the amount of space savings potentially there is, is pretty large. This I did not actually measure, unlike the, the previous <coughs> case where I showed where the symbols information overhead by size. So I, I don't know the actual savings of this, these changes. So I put this on the mail list. Uh, David came back with um, a good suggestion, which was, let me jump up there, but here we go. Um, putting additional new tags after a property that contained a P handle. So this new tag would kind of back reference to the previous property and saying what fields in this property are P handles. So again, it's adding a new tag. We've, we've broken our format. This gives us really nice advantages. Um, when the bootloader wants to modify the struct block, add nodes, delete nodes, add or delete properties, it can handle these very easily. In my initial proposal, it'd be very hard for the bootloaders to be making those modifications because I have references from other blocks outside of the struct block pointing into it. So this is a really good idea. This also gives us the ability to decompile an FDT and recover what is a P handle reference as data. And we can then recreate the actual symbolic, the symbol on the node and the P handle name, which may end up being an arbitrary P handle name, pointing back to that. No, it actually would be the correct uh, P handle name reference. So that's one item right now. When we decompile, we lose those P handle name references. This would give us that, that ability, which would be really nice to have. Okay, questions? How am I on time, Sean? So if we're going to change the tags, can we do it in a way that we change them where we can add new ones later without breaking compatibility? <laughs> like, uh, I mean, if we had masked out uh, most of the bits in the existing software, then if we added new bits, uh, then we could support that without breaking compatibility, I think. I, I think so. I, I like the idea. Simon, I didn't look at your proposed tag formats thinking about this, but I, I think the idea that you have of adding a lot of complexity into what a tag can be, actually, I, I think there's a way to achieve Rob's goal. So you might be able to have a flag which says, this is a fixed size tag, and we'd have maybe a convention that the size of the tag is the very first field after. We, we don't want to add a length field into every entry if the link is not variable, because that's just overhead. Um, but for variable length fields, maybe we could have a convention. Maybe the next field is length. Or we, we, I, I believe it's achievable somehow. I think that's, so, that's a goal that we should put in there. And I have the yeah, same I, concept with headers. I think those should be more easily extensible without breaking compatibility. Yeah, go ahead. I, I didn't actually mention it, but in the, um, in the slides or, no, in the doc, actually, that, uh, yeah, I, if, if you can't represent the length and the bits that you have, you just put it in the, in the cell afterwards. And my, my um, size numbers sort of reflect that. And same with the string thing. Um, but I, I think, I know backwards compatibility is, is very useful, but, one problem is if, as soon as you use a tag in your new um, thing, uh, they don't know what to do with it, right? So I, I guess you're saying put the length of the tag in there and that way you can skip it? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of annoying. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, obviously it can only be things that can be optional. 
right? And we'll probably still have to break stuff, but right now we do in, any unknown tag, I think, just blows up. Seems like we could do better there. Yeah. I was about to say Grant's amazingly quiet. Ooh. Yeah, that's a challenge. <laughs> I mean, it's, we're, yeah, just the way that we're handling the tags, is sort of, and anything we do is going to be a compatibility break. Um, I was intrigued by what you were talking about earlier, Simon, with uh, the ABI, or the API changes that are required. Um, because I'm mostly thinking, regardless of what we do, we're going to have a, an AB, ABI breakage, which means we need a transition period, which means we need the library to support both. And we can't support both until we've got the API changes. So that would be priority to me, is figure out what is wrong with the current LibFTT API that needs to be changed so that we can still do flat parsing of the tree, uh, in-place parsing of the tree, um, and with an API that works both with the old format and whatever new format we come up with. Um, because once we do that, then I think there's, there can be the, an iterative point in time of experimenting with what is the best way to do this. I, I think you know, some of the little things that are being talked about, like for doing the p-handle tag and stuff like that, it's going to be painful and get us very little actual, actual benefit. Um, it might be a little bit like a Band-Aid and we've got to rip it off to do the API changes on the library and figure out how to get those into the projects that need it. And then at the same time, be experimenting with format. Once the format is set, there's going to be years where we're handling both. Actually, it'll be indefinite where we're handling both the old and the new uh, format. So if we're going to have multiple formats, maybe this, the priority needs to be figure out what it is that is actually needed instead of Band-Aid fix, fixes. Yeah, I, um, I definitely agree with starting with the API. Um, the good thing is that the, the problematic functions are not very, there's not very many. There's the one I mentioned that returns a, pr a property struct, which I hate anyway. I think it's, I think it's not a good API. Um, there's not very many, actually. So long as get prop still works, um, I made sure that the type information didn't spill out into the value. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good approach. So I was going to say that it seems like the, the get prop uh, one would, could preserve the existing functionality with the new encoding. So it, we wouldn't have to change anything for, for existing drivers. And then if we add the additional uh, APIs to get yeah. a specific field out, which would give us kind of a good way to, to support moving forward. And do you yeah. see any complication with trying to support that? <laughs> Sorry. We're another mic. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Sorry. Because John likes to get annoying. It's, it adds complexity with us. Yeah. Um, sorry. What was the question? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to throw it again for a different reason. Um, no, I was saying that, I mean, if the idea is that uh, get property right now returns a struct, and that's kind of obnoxious. But uh, if we change the, the semantics of that function, that's going to force uh, okay. changes in the code. But if we preserve that with the new encoding behind it, um, then we don't have to change all those drivers that are looking at properties or other yes. places are looking at properties. Um, and then we can add, as we need them, functions that decode that new structure. And yeah. I was asking if you've, you saw any problems with that approach. Are you saying having static data in the function that it fills in and returns? Yeah. OK, we could do that. Uh, yeah, we, we, sure. we, we've, we've got scope problems. Like, sure. We've just got scoping problems that need to be solved yeah. to, because LibFTT has no context. Yeah. Right. There's I, I no context to work with at all. Uh, um, so where do we, how do we actually allocate that space to, put, to store that generated struct? And we don't have a, a way to do that without changing the model of LibFTT. 
I just want to point out the, the comment that there aren't very many places to do that that, that we know of in, in tree, certainly, but out of tree. I'm not sure that we actually know the answer to that question. Um, OK, well, I'm, I'm just speaking Vendor from, kernels, I mean. <laughs> from my experience in, in Ubu, um, getting that, that, that get property thing is used for, for when you have an offset and you're trying to iterate through the properties. It's not a common thing. It's normally in a few places. Uh, it may be used in, in trees uh, that, that we haven't looked at yet, is all I'm saying. It may be a, a much bigger problem than, than we think. You mean out of tree? I, I mean in other vendor trees. OK. Yeah. Do they exist? <laughs> <laughs> That's well, what I'm saying. That it may be a bigger problem I mean, than we realize. The, one other point I should make is that particular function, there's already code in there that says if it's an old version, I can't remember what version, like version 12 or something, return null. So I thought, oh, I'll just return null. You know. <laughs> okay, well, let me jump into overlays. We can come back and talk more about format. Um, especially over lunch. Uh, there's been recent support added to the, de the device tree compiler to make overlays easier to deal with. In the past, people have had to hand code all that metadata, things that people shouldn't have to worry about. It's not, it's not part of what what's your, your purview generally is creating the information. Um, so that helps solve some problems. Another recent change in that, in that uh, tool tree is a new tool called FDT Overlay written by Tantal Pantelis. I've not looked at it. I've not reviewed it. Uh, we do not yet pull that into the kernel and compile it and build it in the kernel. Uh, likely it's going to need some good review and, and some thought about how can, you apply an, how can you apply an overlay to a base device tree in the raw blob form before the bootloader sees it or the kernel sees it versus how do you apply an overlay in a bootloader versus how do you apply an overlay in a live device tree on a running kernel? Because the most restrictive environment is the live kernel environment. They're just, it just gets much more complex and much more difficult. So it may be that the rules that this tool can, can use are different than the rules in the kernel. And we should be very clear about how to build your overlays for each of these environments so it will work. And if you want them compatible through all three, what are the rules for that? U-Boot uh, has the ability to um, apply overlays or load overlays now. That's been around for a while. Word or two, Simon, how well does that work? Is it well supported? Is it fantastic? <laughs> he thumb, two thumbs up. Good. Uh, this solves a lot of problems that I have with overlays. Rob has a, a comment, I think. Uh, there's been an issue reported that you run out of space, and I'm not sure if that's just because you need to reserve more space in your uh, base DT or what the problem is there, but some people are having problems with it. Okay. And there's a test case at patch uh, for DTC that's been posted from the ST folks that have the problem that I was going to go look at. <laughs> okay. I, I really like this approach because it solves a lot of the, the issues with runtime. If drivers are already loaded and you're going to modify their data, how do you deal with that? What are the interactions? If a subsystem um, looks at the device tree before you add the overlay, then you add the overlay in later, does the, the, the how well does the subsystem deal with that change in the data? It's just a much more complex environment. And, and those are things we'll have to deal with with live updates, but this avoids those, and I think it's a lot less fragile. Than, than live updates. I sent a patch in about a, almost a release ago, and it's been going through a whole bunch of testing and comments and reviews, and it's gotten a lot better thanks to all those reviews. And Rob has done a pull on it for 4.21 4 or 5.0, whatever it turns out to be. Assuming it goes through next and people are happy with it, FPGA people have been testing it. Uh, IBM has tested it, so hopefully we've got most of the issues dealt with. Um, the, the, moment, the reason I, behind this patch was avoiding memory leaks, which has been one of my bugaboos with overlays. And secondly, um, don't do a K-free before you actually have removed an overlay. So you're not getting the use after free issues. 
And this doesn't entirely solve use after free. There still may be cases where you remove an overlay and a driver still thinks it has a valid pointer. But, but this is helping to catch some of those issues. And it ends up being code spread throughout various parts of the kernel to deal with it. The intent right now is to not break existing overlays. If you can load an overlay in the existing kernel, it'll still work even with these checks. It'll give you warnings. So you can start dealing with those issues. But it will find a few cases where a current device tree might be not actually a valid device tree once you've loaded the overlay. The classic example is somehow you end up with two instances of adding the same node. And when the uh, apply code tries to add the second instance, it sees a name collision, and it renames it. So now all of a sudden, you have an unexpected name with node with a new name. And same with properties. That same result can happen. And that's been a silent problem. And you would only see that if you tried to access that data and got the wrong value. Yeah? Where's the hesitation in just making it fail to apply? Is, is the, I mean, it the, seems the, to me like right, the only right. time it would fail to apply, yeah, it's, it's going to be toxic. Right. Um, the issues, the warnings are a warning of two things. One is warning that it's going to apply successfully, and there's no problem right now. When you go and remove it, there's going to be a memory leak. So if you're applying, removing, applying, removing, applying, removing millions of times, that becomes an issue for you. That's an issue right now in the current kernels. You just don't know what's happening. So this is giving you time to not break your existing systems, but correct your problems. Um, the other problem would be if you don't actually bring your reference counts low enough to, to k-free it. And again, it's, in that, you'll find out when you're, you're releasing the overlay. You won't know that when you're applying it. So again, you have a memory leak, and you're losing memory. So maybe I'm a little naive in this, but if you allow a potential memory leak, you're, you're creating an opportunity for very subtle bugs as opposed to forcing a development with, this, with a failure case. Um, it, it's a denial of service attack potentially, but what sort of oh, bugs okay. are you? I didn't, yeah. yeah. So long, I, I don't want that to remain too long, but the idea is to give people time to realize they have an issue and, and start coding for it. And, and this is going to evolve. There are going to be more issues coming up, I think, as we just learn more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, often also the actual issues and like random driver code that I wasn't aware of overlays. So uh, it, it will take some time to sort of find all, the, all of them and fix them. So I think it's a good approach to sort of warn and, and, and then, yeah. you know. Yeah, it might not be in the code that you own. Like the example found was in the clock code. So someone else may have to fix that. Unit test has a whole lot of warnings and errors now. Just be expecting those. Um, since I'm running short, I'm not going to go through in details of these. But if anyone wants to understand what causes each of these messages, um, I'm willing to sit down. And if we, we could grab another room at some point this week and, and walk through these, I, or if at the end of the, the entire track, if we still have time left, I can come back to this. Yeah, OK. Uh, they're, they're set of. Um, applying, accessing, and removing messages. And I, I do list the cause here. Hopefully it's not too cryptic if you read the slides. This is the example where I said you have an overlay that you think is valid. When you go to apply it, you're getting this problem where you have a name collision and corruption. And that's been pretty much invisible unless you actually looked at the underlying data or looked at what nodes existed in, in slash proc slash device tree and property names. There was a, a warning message on the console. I don't know how many people look at their consoles for warning messages when loading overlays. These are the unit test um, device resources that were used to create some of those warnings and errors. So you can see examples of how to, what, what the bad patterns are that will cause those problems. Again, these are for reference. And then there's one more class of errors. These are, we did something wrong in our internal coding in the core device tree. And when we went to remove things, the data structure didn't look like what we expected. So that means that internally in our overlay, overlay apply and remove code, we've got a bug somewhere. 
So it's not a problem with your overlay. And that's this message. Okay, we've talked about this before, this, the size issues. One thing, I keep seeing slides in presentations and current conferences which are showing people how to hand code device resource files with the metadata hand coded, the overlays, the fragments, uh, usually not the fix ups, local fix ups and symbols. They usually don't hand code those, but there's still some examples of that. So I'm really trying to get the message out, don't hand code those things. Just start using, so this is an example of hand coded fragment, all this colored stuff is essentially metadata which we used to have to hand code before the compiler knew how to deal with automatically creating it. So all that colored stuff gets replaced with a simple p handle reference. And the device tree compiler now creates all that extra metadata stuff for you. So please get the word out to people, quit hand coding that stuff, just use the magic. And these are just more details about that, issues, issues. I think we can skip all this, yeah. Okay, back to questions, more questions on this. I think I have three minutes. Hey, on the, the, the class of uh, metadata that you're, you're trying to get the word out, have we considered adding uh, uh, warnings to DTC? What I would like to do <laughs> is to add a command line flag to DTC. It's gonna be one of two possible ways of approaching it. One is saying, I will not compile, I will not consider this valid source format unless you apply this flag. So it's a flag saying, I'm going to build what would otherwise be an invalid DTC or DTS. The opposite approach would be the opposite of that. What did I just say? <laughs> E either saying, flag that e either that. allowing or prohibiting one right. way or the other, and the default would be the opposite of what the flag would do. The, the nice thing about having the default being prohibiting this as valid source is that you warn a whole lot of people who not, know nothing about this. They go and use the next version of the tool, and all of a sudden they have this warning spewed. And hopefully the warning says, oh, by the way, you can temporarily use this compile flag to compile your old device tree, but convert it to the new format. That's gonna probably upset a whole lot of people. So I, I don't know what the overall decision makers who decide which way to do the flags will, will decide. But I think that would be the way to approach it. The obvious question is who are the decision makers? Uh, David Gibson's the decision maker on this. So we need to buy him beers? Is yeah, yeah and, and David's in Australia this week. He's not here, he's unable to make it. Yeah. Uh, I think from your slides earlier, I've just discovered a tool called FDT Overlay. Is that the what's the current state of being able to apply overlays from a use running kernel? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do okay. we have applying Do we have a current means to apply overlays to a applying running kernel? Applying overlays from user from user space. space for a running kernel. Right, from a running kernel. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, that, that's fine. As long as um, you've got an we, answer. We, there, there's There's an issue there. And if you look at my slides, I actually have a, a page on the eLinux wiki saying kind of my observations on, on what we need to resolve to get to the point where we can do that. And I think we can phase it in. So for instance, we might be able to do applies. And if you do only applies and no removes, you can ignore all the memory leak issues because memory leak issues come when you remove. So there might be stages where we can start phasing in more and more support. Uh, but there's that, there's locking is a really big issue, use after free, and those are things that I want to deal with before we get widespread use of overlays. FPGAs well, are using overlays. I mean, there's patches and trees that people are using and uh, no one submits them upstream. Yeah. And they were at one point and um, we can keep changing the kernel APIs and keep breaking them and maybe they'll get annoyed enough to upstream it. Yeah, but, but I don't want to accept the overlay application code until we have a valid foundation that it can work on. It works great for single use cases. There are communities who have single boards, the overlays work on those boards, but they don't handle the general cases. They, they open all these windows of problems. I, I wanna get rid of as many of those problems as we can, and it becomes a risk 
benefit point where the problems are small enough, you can accept the risk of, of adding that functionality. So we're, we'll be walking into that a bit at a time, I think. The, the other question back at you is, uh, what's your use case that can't be solved by applying it in the bootloader? Because that solves a lot of them. Yes, thank you, bootloader people, very much for that. <laughs> We've got a, um, a multi-camera system, and one of the things we're looking at is fault tolerance of how, when one of those devices breaks or you could detect that it's broken. Uh, or you might want to change what physical device, it, it's got a cable, so you might be able to unplug it. We want to, well, I am envisaging how do I, at runtime, say, I now have an RDA CM20 connected, and I want to apply an overlay that says that's physically connected, or it's a 21 or a 22. I need to describe that at runtime, uh, and an overlay would do that, but I don't have a means of doing it, so. All right, I think we're gonna, um Maybe come back to that topic. Uh, Moritz is going to talk about F FPGA and device tree. Uh, keep talking while he gets mic'd up. If you have okay. One. Did you want to? I, I know. I'm trying to be gracious about it. But never mind. All right. Test. Good. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, well, no, nope, never mind. Here. All right. Better? I'll make this weird. <laughs> it might look a bit w funny on the video, but uh, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll just hold it. So, uh, yeah, my, my name is Moritz Fischer. I work for National Instruments. Uh, the other co-presenter that unfortunately couldn't be here is uh, Alan Tal, works at Intel. And together, uh, we maintain the FPGA Manager framework. Um, probably most of the people have heard already a bit about FPGAs. I just want to you know, give a brief overview of the problem statement that we set out to solve back in, back in the days. Um, FPGAs are basically hardware that can be reconfigured at runtime to be whatever your RTL skills allow you to do. And um, there are little to no restrictions to what can be implemented inside of the FPGA. Uh, depending on your setup, you either want to, you know, reconfigure the full FPGA, which is what we call full reconfiguration, or just a part, which is, you know, if you have a bus attached like PCI Express, you want to keep the link up, you only want to reprogram things that are behind that bus. So that's just like an intro to uh, what's going to come in the next slides. Um, yeah, basically, um, when you pr program that FPGA, you'll end up with a lot of new devices that show up or, you know, if you runtime reprogram, it might go away. And, uh, you know, FPGA Manager sort of gives you a framework at several levels of abstraction to deal with this. And um, the actors we have there is basically, we have an FPGA Manager, which is the low-level driver that deals with actually programming um, the FPGA. Then we have a region that uh, represents a part of it, uh, of an FPGA or a full FPGA if you do a full reconfiguration. And um, FPGA regions sometimes, you know, need to be isolated when you reprogram stuff. And, um, you know, I'm doing all this sort of as a reference. We'll talk about open problems a bit later in, in the end. I have like 10 slides, so not too many. Uh, th there's a bunch of info on those links. Uh, the latter one is our car and driver API in the upstream kernel. Uh, and um, then there's Alan's talk that introduces the whole thing in a bit more detail. Um, well, so how does DT fit in there? Well, um, most FPGA designs use some sort of fundamentally non-discoverable bus like SPI, I2C, or just plain memory mapped I.O. Um, DT is made to describe non-discoverable <coughs> hardware, and um, DT code largely assumes a static device tree. Uh, you know, DT overlays were introduced to allow runtime changes, and uh, when we first started out with FPGA Manager, uh, we thought that's, you know, a real good fit for the use case we have, where hardware changes at runtime, the hardware is not discoverable, so we're going to use uh, the device tree overlays. Uh, the problem, most um, DT code in the kernel predates overlays, and not all places where you could apply an overlay uh, you know, not all of them deal well with it as we discussed in um, Frank's talk just before. 
as a result of that, as of 419, 422, we don't really have a workable user space interface for DT-based systems. For uh, PCI Express, we sort of figured it out, um, or Intel did for us. Um, for device tree based systems, we don't really have a way to, to uh, using upstream code to deal with FPGAs. Um, here's an example, and totally guilty, I think, with the overlay. No, actually, not, no, not guilty of what Frank said about the syntax. <laughs> um, basically, again, what I said before, usually your system looks somewhat like you have an FPGA manager that's in charge of reprogramming things. You have the bridge that isolates your region. You have a, I can actually point. You have a region, and um, that region might have a list of bridges that you need to use to isolate your region during reprogramming. You apply the overlay. Uh, you know, you specify a firmware name, which will basically contain your bitstream. We use the Linux internal uh, uh, firmware subsystem to load stuff from lib firmware, and then your new nodes show up, and we do an OF populate. I'll go into details on the next slide a bit further. One thing to note is we also have certain properties like firmware name that are FPGA manager specific that we parse on applications. So there might be stuff like encryption, compression, um, those kind of things that would also be there and we parse those out when we're notified of reconfiguration. Uh, yeah, so a bit more detail what happens if you call the OF overlay apply um, that calls of overlay notify which then um, you know has a notifier a blocking notifier eventually that gets to your FPGA region um, at that point we look at what's in the overlay that's being presented to us like the firmware name um, or other properties as I mentioned like encryption things like that we program the FPGA, if then the low-level driver says, yep, your FPGA is up and running again and that all worked out, then um, the overlay goes into the live tree. Uh, there's more information about the binding, you can find it here. And this was sort of our original plan, right? And it s sounds all very clean and nice because, you know, it, it seemed like the match made in heaven, but um, I skipped over the part of how does the DT overlay get into the kernel in the first place. So uh, a lot of people told me just do this, basically, you know, make your hardware discoverable. Uh, that has two drawbacks. Block RAM is usually a scarce resource in an FPGA. That would be where after synthesizing the hardware, your stuff ends up in FPGA block RAM. So that didn't really work out. And also it doesn't work for uh, old FPGA designs. There's a lot of people that just have systems out there and kind of um, saying that is like telling people that have a spy device, oh, too bad, you should have made it USB, you know? <laughs> and then it will just work. So um, that really didn't work for us. Um, Pentalis had an idea with the config FS interface that went through seven revisions, but um, that was a generic solution. That was not just for FPGA manager. Um, Garrett somewhat maintains that in his tree. I have the link there just for people in case they need it. And uh, it, it's widely used, actually so widely that um, our products are, that we ship also use that because I needed something. A quick comment. Uh, Whenever I do things to break this interface, I make sure that Geert's CC'd on the patch and make sure that he tests it. <laughs> yeah. So he definitely, he, he will gate me if I do something to break this. And uh, it's widely used so widely that basically last time I updated our kernel for our production systems, basically my patch didn't apply and then I realized that the Yocto kernel already applied that patch uh, in their kernel tree. Um, there's discussion around why that's not a good idea and Frank pointed out a bunch of uh, those before. Uh, there's also references down here um, for those that want to go back in history and look at why that wasn't a good idea. Um, it boils down to, as Frank said, a lot of things break miserably if you apply overlays to them. And, uh, you know, th that just doesn't work. So, um, then we had ideas, you know, we discovered we can't just apply things anywhere and things will, will work. So, what if we lock down wh where we apply overlays and, and allow only in certain areas, as you pointed out. Um, 
Alan had an RFC um, where he basically implemented a whitelist in the DT core where the driver would say, hey, I can deal with overlays. Um, the feedback we got from Rob and, and Frank was mostly around the actual implementation. Um, Alan had used a, uh, a linked <coughs> list. Um, then it was proposed to actually use a flag in the node as opposed to you know, actually having a list which would be more efficient. Um, and Frank finally said, well, just use DT connectors. And um, there's an RFC, I have the links down there. Um, there were a bunch of presentations, so I sort of collected a lot of things for people that are interested later to see where we were at at this point in time. Um, the, there's emails from Frank that sort of state the general problem of uh, device tree connectors. Um, at this point, I'm not entirely sure. I, Neither Alan or me could figure out like where we're at exactly with device tree connectors right now. Um, most discussions I found on the list were around the actual implementation and how you know tooling, device tree compiler, and uh, yeah, it, it seemed very conceptual at this stage. Am I wrong about that? You're right. It's been discussed, but nowhere near a solid implementation yet. Okay. So I have two things I would like to discuss basically. Um, the first one is uh, whitelisting for DT overlays. Said something we could maybe as an intermediate term solution look at, um, assuming we fix up the implementation. Um, can we salvage so. the RFC that Alan had somewhat? Um, that would basically boil down to drivers saying, or subsystems saying, I can deal with overlays. Um, or the other option would be you know, looking at um, connectors for FPGAs and that. I discussed a bit with Alan on that. Um, in general, it seems like there's some progress on the GPIO side with the GPIO Nexus uh, bindings moving forward, but other than that, we weren't clear on who's working on that. Um, it, it seemed like conceptually it would work for FPGA manager, but uh, it also seems from our point of view that since you can have arbitrary buses with almost anything in an FPGA, it's some, somehow like the least beneficial, like yeah. FPGAs would be the least beneficial user of connectors because we'd have to sort of fix all possible connectorized uh, plugins before we can start using it. And uh, yeah, so I was wondering if people have ideas on that. And, that's the end of my slides, and if, if people have... What? So, oh. so um, I've probably historically been the most vocally against the generic driver uh, for the things that you put up on the, um, on the slide. Um, given how widely it's used, first of all, am I wrong? And should we just merge the... My position has been against the generic driver for applying overlays, okay. right? Because because I've been concerned so about the, so against the the against Pentelis's right okay uh, driver. Um, it's widely used. It's I mean it's in Yocto. It's at the Raspberry Pi at folks ask for it a lot. There hasn't really been significant forward progress on anything else. Um, am I wrong? Should this actually be merged and then we treat problems as security bugs and fix up from there? I thought you guys had a interface to load the overlay. No, basically we're using the config fs thing or then vendor specific, you know, you have a character device that takes an ioctal with an overlay. But at, at this point we don't have any other way of putting it in the kernel, which sort of... I mean, maybe the PGA manager subsystem has, should have its own way to do it. I mean, all, all the infrastructure should be there to do, to, to load the overlay from within the the FPGA device manager. So, um, so you're saying, I mean, ba basically, a as I talked about, we already inspect the overlay, right? 
So you're saying if at that point we make sure we don't target things outside of, of the FPGA region via an internal whitelist that we keep, that would be okay? It's your driver. Yep. How, how do you load your bitstream now? Or how do you acquire the bitstream to... Because it seems like you have the same problem. You need to get a, a bitstream from somewhere for the FPGA and you need the associated FTT. So that's sort of like one conceptual package. So if, if we go back... Uh, here, there is a, you know, we have like this firmware name that comes as part of the overlay, and the overlay gets into the kernel for most people through it, the config FS patch. So the bitstream itself, how do you load that from user space? Using firmware, the firmware interface. Firmware. Okay. So okay. yeah, I mean, we, we, we could come up with a way where we cat them together into a file, make it a header or something, you know, that, that okay. mechanism would be there, but our understanding so far was that all our attempts sort of didn't yeah. go anywhere because there was so, no way to lock down what I can overlay using an overlay. Part of the problem with the generic interface is no one's submitting it upstream. I mean, we can't really, we've outlined what issues should be fixed in it. Um, and I, for me, the bit, I think one of the biggest issues is just not allowing any random change to the base DT. So you can only add nodes below a certain level or you can't go add a property at any node in the tree. Yeah, like, an example of my checks that are checking for memory leaks, et cetera, some of the memory leaks are because you're modifying or adding a property in an existing node. So if we could list more clearly what are acceptable practice, like Rob was saying, of only add new nodes in certain, and things in that node and below. Don't modify existing nodes. One problem is that one of the current practices of using overlays is to modify the status of the node and, and enable it. So th this would say we're not going to support that at this point. That would be one of the non-supported uses. And that one's kind of an easy one to support. I agree that we should could not support that at first and then add that, but right. um, I mean, you could apply an overlay that goes and changes your memory size. Yeah, what what do we do with that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, so if, if we basically say each FPGA region gets a SysFS entry that is called overlay, that allows me to load an overlay and then in my FPGA manager framework, I look at that, I make sure all the possible targets the overlay has would be an FPGA region, then you'd be okay with that? Yeah. The overlay apply code should be doing those checks, our, our internal code. Yeah, it's all right. Invalidation. You shouldn't have to do it out, outside. We, um, but one quick comment, yeah. back to the slide you were just on. That one? The notify pre apply. One of my concerns has, has always been use after free, you know, passing out references to device tree. That pre-apply pre code has full access to the tree and can take references. And al allowing them to do this, part, part of my compromise was that I've added to the maintainer's file a file entry or a, a function entry, I forget what it's called, Anybody who wants to have one of these pre-apply um, functions, that's going to come to me <laughs> for review because of the maintainer's file, hopefully. And those are very narrow use of the device tree. It's, it's very easy to audit them. So, so far, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. They're not flying all over the tree and, and modifying stuff. They're just looking at a very small segment and not modifying anything. So at this point, I'm happy with that. I just want to comment on uh, something that was just said there. Rob was saying, for instance, you shouldn't be able to change the amount of memory that you have. Uh, I would say currently that's probably a, a valid situation, but is that a long-term uh, likely uh, kind of thing? Pluggable memory is, is something that could, in fact, come along. I, I keep on coming back to the idea of, of policy and mechanism, and I'm concerned that we're baking policy into the kernel with all these comments. Uh, a lot of these things that people are saying, well, we shouldn't be able to do that. Is that true? Because maybe that's true yesterday and maybe today, but is that true tomorrow? 
because we keep on coming up, uh, people keep coming up with, with new ways of, of looking at the world. You know, Harbor can't change. Well, actually it can because of SPGAs. Like, yeah. what I'm trying to say is, is I think we've got to be really careful about, about mandating policy. Right. Sa saying that uh, I cannot at this time imagine that we should be able to do this going forward. Now I realize that there's security concerns and everything else. I, I get that. But what I'm saying is, is that I, I don't think we should be making blanket statements that memory sizes will never change. Because I can think of situations yeah. where that could happen in yeah, the future. Yeah, we're not precluding memory sizes. No, I'm just using that as an yeah, example. Yeah, I know. It's, it's actually a good example. Yeah, it we're, is. We're not precluding it from ever being supported. What we're saying right now is that if you try and change that, the underlying code that has to be able to deal with the memory change, the hot plugging, right. that's not integrated into this framework. It isn't at the so, moment, it's correct. So given that there's not the underlying support, we can right now prohibit it. But if that underlying support became added, then we could remove the restriction. So, so it's, we're not architecting a way that we won't be able to add it in the future. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, is the best way to do that would be a stub that basically said, you know, not implemented at this time, as opposed to just saying, no, you can't change memory. Because that sends a different signal to people when they read the, they read the code. You see what I'm saying? So, so what I'm trying to say is, is um, it's important that whatever, however this is done, uh, is done in such a way that people can't change things. If we say things can't be changed under a certain level, that precludes any changes to things at the base level. And I can, again, I can imagine situations in the future where we will want to yeah. change things yeah, in the base point, tree. I'm thinking it's more like we're saying, we will allow you to do this subset of the functionality. We will allow you to do that subset. It, so it's, it's kind of the positive as opposed to the negative. Does that make sense? It so does. I, I still feel we're going too far. Yeah. We're, we're, we're baking policy in. Here. Well, the flip side is we can't just leave it wide open and then no, tighten no. it down later. So we're trying I'm to not suggesting that we should design the API that the that is a lot does allow anything to happen, uh, but then whitelist what we actually allow up yeah, from I'm the just, start. I'm just saying we and then add to that over time. We may include future things if we're not careful. So well, and the reality is this has been sitting out there for a while, and w as as Rob was saying with comments, and so it hasn't been resubmitted. So maybe by focusing it in on the specific domain of FPGA and limiting what can change there, doesn't really necessarily say anything about what else could change in the future, but it, it kind of focuses the, the set of changes to kind of be the, the forerunner, right? That says this is actually a good way to do things. It, I, that's my two cents. All I know is if we say in this meeting today and it's published that you cannot change your memory going forward, that is... Be, uh, no, I, I, I just said the word if. Yeah, yeah, I, I, said, I said if we say that, then that's going to be the pronouncement that people read and follow. So, so, and I'm not saying you said that. What I'm saying is, is we have to be careful about those kinds of pronouncements because the, the reality is, is that we may... Uh, again, that, that, that I agree with you that doesn't make sense today. <laughs> But that I can imagine a situation where that, you know, you implemented in an FPGA, for instance, which I realize is insane, but, but it, it can be done. And so extending memory is conceivable at this point. Again, just as an example. So it's, it's already supported with device tree, I think, because I think power PC systems Do they? Yeah. can plug uh, memory. Yeah, that makes sense. I know, I know uh, CPU-wise they do that. Yeah, yeah they specifically but do. That does point. not come from user space. That comes from... Probably the service processor base. Right, and it does base. not come through overlays. It, it comes from them calling dynamic device tree code directly. Correct. All right, so would it be a fair statement to say if we were to, you know, take another look at that first RFC, address the comments you guys made, and then figure out a way to load something through the FPGA manager framework, that would be a Valid way forward. <laughs> so you have two bullet points there. The first one is the the whitelist concept or some version, some conceptually equivalent. So that part seems fine, and I, I think we could accept that without a problem. It seems like a good idea, right? Yeah, and. Uh I'm trying to remember. There was something Alan had uh, that I said it looked fine, and but he had no user yet. I can't remember what that was. Okay, yeah, I don't remember why it, it got hung up at that point, but conceptually it seems like a good idea to me. Okay. The, cool. I mean, the DT connector 
from Pentelis, I think, was... Uh, I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, it, it just lost momentum. People weren't actively working on it. People have to think through the issues, think through the alternatives, consider what's the best way to implement it. And, and that just died. Nobody put the time into it. I, I think they're on the connector stuff, we're going to have to go uh, binding by binding and figure out how that works. And we've done GPIOs. So we need to figure out I2C, SPI. And I, I, don't, I don't think you have to use that here. Yeah. If you think conceptually about what the connector idea was, on boards, there physically is a connector. Uh, classically, there is, say, the PCI connector. Uh, you could have a physical connector that is just a SPI bus or just an I squared C bus. Those are really simple examples to create a, a description of what does that connector look like. When you get into boards that essentially expose, for all practical purpose, the entire pin set of the processor, of the SOC, and those are highly multiplexed, that's where the complexity comes in, and that's part of why I think connectors stalled trying to conceptually figure out how to deal with that. And maybe connectors is the wrong idea for that. I, I really yeah. don't know how to deal with Is there a problem SOCs. to solve there because it's highly tied to the SOC? So why do you need to describe the connector? Uh, be, because you get connectors that appear on boards which have, can have, or many different boards with many different SOCs. Or yes, or um, the t the BeagleBone uh, connectors, or the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Um, they, they all they all have a standard connector that appears on multiple boards. Right, but those cases the they're tied to the the SOC because of the pin muxing. Different, SOCs. Nope. Mm. Different SOCs, same header. So, so, so I, I I make my mega wonderful audio card. Um, for 96 boards or Raspberry Pi or whatever, uh, and I want to write one overlay that describes what's on the bo on that card because it's a physical object and I can't describe it. I don't want to have to describe it for every possible baseboard it could be plugged into. Right, but you're in that case that board works for a certain pin muxing, right? And if the pin muxing is different, it wouldn't work on a different baseboard. But so. The but the, these connectors all have standard things that are brought out from the, so the particular way you, you do the, thanks, Sean. <laughs> so the, the particular way you do the pin muxing is not standard. Yeah. Um, so but, but, but the thing you can get through, things you can get through doing the pin muxing are standard. And some of those are, um, it's not just um, this one thing is always brought up on this signal. Some of them have some flexibility there. Yeah, so I think the, the connector description is tied to the SOC, not to the board. So you have multiple boards using the same SOC, using the same standard connector. If that conceptually helps think about it. Yeah, I, I mean, in cases where you have standard pinouts, 96 boards doesn't allow pin muxing, at least by the spec, but I'm, <laughs> imagine well. that. I imagine that there are cases where uh, that's not followed. Um, right, where is pi and, and But and in the, the cases where it is followed, out. sure, you need a connector and where you follow, you have the standard pinout for Raspberry Pi and follow that, then yes, you need a connector. It was more the cases where it's purely aware of the base board because it knows the pin muxing and then maybe you don't need a connector, I don't. All right, um, that was all I got. Um, that's <laughs> good news. So uh, <laughs> we'll clean up the stuff, resubmit, and uh, hopefully not talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> Until the next time. All right. And this is where Kate holds me to the grindstone. <laughs> For some reason, the Plumbers Conference likes it if we summarize what happened. And in the closing session, they want us to stand up and give a two-minute presentation. No, you're fine. No presentations? No presentations this year. Woo! Yay! <laughs> we do need to have summaries and actions.
So oh. that we can make this go forward. We don't revisit the same thing in a year's time. Yeah, I was going to say actions was the second half of that. And okay. that that's a separate one. Um, Sean has been taking really good notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have asked you to like highlight what's an action item and what's not. I, I only caught a few in a few sessions. That's right. Oh, good. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how productive it is to stand here and, and do it real time, but I, th I think I'll do a little bit of that. And uh, yeah, Hurt, hurting cats. Well, you have things like the connectors. I mean, you're, you're going to have a, a group of people who have to work in the, on the mailing lists. And, um, so the ones I noted real quickly in Rob's talk, um, Kate suggested having a transition plan and having documentation so that binding owners will, will be able to effectively do that. Um, Rob had a, a whole open question slide which had a whole bunch of stuff on it. So that was a, a gold mine. Uh, from the FPGAs, at the very last slide was the some conceptually way to whitelist drivers, bringing that forward and moving forward on the, the concept of connectors and the implementation of that. So I have a very meager list at this point for action items. Um, people who want to do the thing, so whitelist, I'm guessing Alan will probably take that on. Yeah, I mean, someone will send a patch in when, when they're ready to do that. Connectors has been sitting stale for a long time. I don't see people jumping up and, and doing that anytime soon. Um, it's not on my to-do list for, for the near future because I'm more focused on that foundational stuff. I want to yeah. clean up the underlying issues. Yeah. Yes. So, so Linus Valley is looking at the um, uh, doing the subset of stuff that he was supposed to um, uh, provide a compatible string for the uh, for basically loading a board file for the uh, module you plug in. Um, uh, that's I'm all. Sorry, say that again. So uh, Linus Valley yeah. is work. Uh, it's not connectors, but it's intended for the at least the um, sort of plug-in module it was use the case. The CPI versus device tree, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so, so he's the, up to like version four. And yeah, I, so I a review of that. Yeah, so b b yeah. Uh, he's um, essentially it boils down to loading a board file for the um, plug-in module uh, based on some identifying information. Um, yeah, I, the, I, I owe him a review of, of all the versions through that because just looking at the most recent version conceptually doesn't address because he keeps, it's evolving over time and I have to think of it as, as a whole, it's, it's yeah. evolved. So that's on my plate. I know Rob has done some reviews on it and I I've, I've, have made some comments but they've been very shallow comments along the way. But as yeah. far as so, an action item, we can certainly capture it to, yeah, we might want to look at it again. Well, that, well, the, that wasn't, ask? It wasn't presented here, so I don't think we need to make an action item. But I'm sure Linus mm -hmm. will carry it forward if he. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he, he's, it's getting a bit discouraged by the whole difficulty yeah. in getting anything reviewed in this yeah. space. Cause that's already a massive D scope. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I definitely owe but it, it, may, it may, on that. It may, it may, if it, it may be enough to mean that the connectors thing isn't actually a big issue anymore. Like it may be good enough for what people need to um, temporarily at least address it. Okay. Like I said, maybe we just write it down for later consideration. I don't think we, yeah. with five minutes left. Well, we're yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not going to solve it here, but it, yeah. it's a, it's yeah. a possible way forward on the connectors thing. Yeah, sure. So my, my recording proposal was just to, I mean, we know we need a node to describe a connector. We can do that much and just don't deviate from kind of what we've already defined or where, where we think we're going with the definitions. Yeah. So like the last version I think had GPIOs in there and used something different than GPIO map, which is what we want to use for mapping connect GPIOs through connectors. So one other thing that I captured and I'm going to kind of just take what you said and then move on. Um, the, one of the other things, and Simon, I asked you to maybe start socializing your your proposals around uh, size improvements, uh, so that we have a little bit of more discussion about that. Also, uh, we it seems like from my perspective, we've had uh, quite a few different RFCs and and consider or proposals for um, sizing, and it would be very useful to start trying to actually 
make that change uh, mature into something that goes in. Um, so as, as, a, as something we might want to, we might want to capture. Yeah, so that really comes down to the the flattened device tree format. Yes. Getting that that discussion to start moving forward again. And again, that's it's stalled on the mail list back in January. So unless we start getting people interested in people who are going to contribute code, because it's going to take code in the compiler associated tools in the kernel, and, and people interested in, in the various projects, how they're impacted. And as Simon said, when we do this, we want it to, to capture all the changes we anticipate over the next few years. We don't want to do one now and do it again in a year. So we want to try and capture as many ideas as we can now so people can encourage everyone to think about that. What do they need? What do they think can get added that will help them in the, in the format? How do they think it needs to change? And, and sort of one of the implied things there, too, was uh, to try and engage with some of the communities that aren't really uh, here. So, I mean, we obviously we have U-Boot and we have Linux and we have Zephyr, but, you know, BSD folks, I don't know if there's anybody with connection uh, to BSD. Um, I'm not seeing anybody jump up and down but we want to make sure that whatever we're talking about doesn't create you know, some sort of a, a island that they, yeah. they end up on. Yeah, fortunately, we do see some BSD participation on the lists, so yeah. that helps. Did we miss anything? Simon. Um, so can we just talk about the ordering? So the idea of doing libftt changes first. Um, so the uh, API API changes. So Grant was saying, let's talk about that first, um, because that's the thing that needs a transition plan. Sorry, I'm good. Oh. He, he sort of yeah, just gave you 10 minutes extra, so it is worth it. I had the time wrong. I thought that we were ending at 12.20, not 12.30. So hey, cool, we got 10 more minutes. Um, say that again, Simon, sorry. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to get the ordering straight. So if we do the libftt API changes first, like getting rid of, you know, get prop, ftt get property or making it return null or something, and, you know, talking to David about that, then we have more freedom, right, to actually change the format. Sure. Um, before that, though... From the kernel perspective, we have driver after driver after driver that's yeah. getting back pointers to those nodes and, and accessing those structures directly. So from the kernel perspective, we need to solve that before we change the format, if we, if we change the, the node format. So the kernel the is... the property format, either of those. The kernel is using the struct property thing all over the place. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then yeah. I think for the kernel, one solution would be simply to allocate memory and return uh, some stable stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It, it's, and that's, to me, controversial, even though I think it's a good idea, because it's going to use more memory. It means the driver who gets that object now has, is responsible, responsible for freeing it. So it's a new Well, approach. it would never so realistically. The kernel only be. uses the strings and values, I think. And, and get property? Yeah, get property. Once you've given the property pointer out, well, the, I mean, the property. There's only a limited number of cases where we go parse uh, flat properties and use them. But I think, I would think that those are mostly, we could audit those. It's probably, I guess that's the, yeah, it, the first step is go and look and see how widespread this is. Maybe yeah. it's worse than we think. But once it's, it's un, once it's unflattened, we're only using I mean, the unflattened copy is not using the struct property. True. Correct, correct. So we're, we're returning our internal property structure, not the flattened structure. And all of our pointers back to the flattened tree are to values, not to actual structure. You're right, you're right. Thank you. I, I was wrong. So that, that's not a barrier to the kernel. <laughs> good, uh, good point. Thanks. Well, if we change it to, to pass null, I believe we still need to change the places. No, 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 no. So, so the point is, it, at Simon's level, he's giving pointers out to the actual flattened device tree structure. Mm -hmm. In the kernel, we unflatten the tree 
we create an in-kernel data structure containing the properties, and that struct property in the kernel does not have to look like what the property entry in the flattened tree looks like. We actually unpack that and put it into an internal, so we don't have to worry about what that flattened structure looks like for driver access. They're only looking at what's been unpacked. So that's Rob's point. Okay, that's good. The, what I was going to trying to get at is, do, does the source format need to change? The source format will need to. As I said, it'll need to change to delete a property in a node. But I think we already have that in the source. It's just that we have no way of getting that into the flattened device tree format. It's only available at the source level. There probably will be a few extra things that need to get added. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. No, nothing okay. jumps out specifically, but yeah. But to, to go back to your original question, yeah, I think if we start with API, then uh, and then start seeing what the ripple is out, uh, then that that's maybe our best approach. Yeah. I another comment I'd make is that I worry that if we send David. Um, a huge, <laughs> you know, here's the here's a proposed new format. It might take forever because he, you know, obviously he's got to consider each point. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't know how we do this. I actually don't understand what the pr process is for a completely new format. Uh, discussion on the mail list. <laughs> uh, he was he actively was participating when I started the thread, it, so I didn't see him as a bottleneck to what I was proposing. I, I think, to me, the bottleneck in a new format is seeking out anybody's needs in the ways they want to change it. Or what, and you have some ideas, and I had some ideas. Maybe that's 80% of what's needed. Maybe somebody else has some brilliant idea that we have no concept there's a need. How do we find those people? How do we encourage them to come forward and give us ideas? I, I think that, that evangelism is, is pretty important. That's part of the reason why I'm asking you to start socializing some of the other things, because hopefully that'll start bringing people out. Otherwise, you will, these changes will go in, and then you know that's when everybody will start to notice, and then they'll be, wait, no, you broke me. Well, you know, we tried to get you to give us input sooner. Well, I, I can send an email. I can write an email that says, hey, if we change the format, this this is this would this these parts of the API would break. So this is why we want to turn these functions down, and, and that would start something, I suppose. Yeah, and I think bringing forward the ideas that you presented today and that you've written up, those are really interesting ideas. And some of them, I think Rob was making the point of, for this specific line item, maybe there's not a big gain, but there's a big cost. So going through and trying to do that balance of which items are worth doing, which are if there is a pain, which ones are worth the pain? If there are ones where there is no pain, we just get gained, that's a good thing. And just select which ones we need to do. And that, that discussion will happen on the list. Yeah, but that, but your proposal, I think, is a, a major step forward in making that visible and, and what could happen and getting people into thinking creatively, I'd say. Maybe even narrowing it down to that, the top one, which was that 27%, which was the property encoding one. And, and then that's, it's not too much for people to consider. Yeah, and Rob's point about being able to move forward adding other changes to this, to tags in a compatible way without breaking existing. So folding that in, I think, is, is important. Okay. So that was the only other one that I had. Okay. So we're trying to make sure that we're, we're summarizing this well, because again, the idea is that this added value in terms of not just discussion, um, but actually call to arms. So is there anything else that uh, folks want to make sure that we capture or isn't in the etherpad? We should probably have put up the etherpad there. Did you get names for who's going to write some JSON schema docs? I think it was uh, <laughs> Rob. Uh, what was his Kate? name? Kate's going to write some? Harry. <laughs> Kate. Uh, no, I, I don't I know. I heard that you name. volunteer. <laughs> we'll look at it. <clears throat> I'd like all of you to volunteer for something, every last one of you, <laughs> to actually go and read the notes at some point. 
whether it's a week in the future, two weeks, whether it's tomorrow, once they're posted on elinux.org, and or even the Etherpad, if past history is an indication, Etherpad will remain open for some amount of time after today. And you can go in and add it, edit and add things in, make sure that, that what is in there was correctly capturing anything you might have said. And even if it does get closed on the Etherpad, I will have a copy of that on elinux.org and we can add comments and notes there or even separate handwritten notes totally independent of Etherpad. So anything you want to add to this for the documentation over time, just email me and be glad to, to include that in the record. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. And we'll be here all week. Come talk to us anywhere. Despite the lack of green stickers on my tag, despite Sean's confusing red, green, and yellow stickers. <laughs>